Happy Thanksgiving to you, my friend. Chris Van Cleet, thank you so much. CBS News meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Baradelli is watching the Thanksgiving weather. So, Jeff, what can we expect? Good morning. Good morning, Vlad. You must be a good luck charm because a second ago it was pouring torrentially and then all of a sudden, as soon as you tossed to me, the sun came out. Well, the sun didn't come out, but the rain did stop and that's good news. Good morning, guys, and good morning, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Take a look at a very quiet Central Park as it should be this morning here on Columbus Circle. So the heavy rain we had here in New York City is now moving out, but it'll be stuck in eastern New England for at least several more hours in early October. And since then, the Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn, as well as several synagogues, have been launching a very fierce legal fight against the state of New York. Uh, what's interesting here is that there won't necessarily be any immediate impact here as the churches and the synagogues that took this all the way to the highest court in the land. They're not actually current subject to the restrictions. That's because they were recently lifted due to what the state describes as an improvement in COVID stats in parts of Queens and in parts of Brooklyn. But as we well know, in this ever-evolving and it's sometimes even worsening COVID saga, those numbers can change and those infections are on the rise. Uh, and that is what much of this is about. The houses of worship have argued that the restrictions violated the religious freedoms under the First Amendment. They also felt that they were unfairly facing stricter limits that, uh, uh, than that of other essential businesses. In fact, Chief Justice Roberts was in dissent and also noted that the religious groups could have the opportunity to return to the court if those restrictions were re-implemented. The Chief Justice writing that it may well be that such restrictions violate the free exercise clause. It is not necessary, however, for us to rule on that serious and difficult question at this time, and it is a significant matter to override determinations made by public health officials concerning what is necessary for public safety in the midst of a deadly pandemic. Ultimately, though, it was actually newly sworn Justice Amy Cody Barrett's vote that eventually swung the justices to this 5-4 ruling. So that's another important aspect of this case here, or this story. It certainly underscores, at least punctuates, uh, the impact that this newly sworn justice has on future cases, Erica. And then, of course, we're left with that question. Does this now lay the groundwork for other religious groups across the country to try to launch this legal fight against cities or states as they try to fill their pews amidst this pandemic? Yeah, will be interesting to see. Polo, thank you. Thank you. President-elect Biden urging unity this Thanksgiving as President Trump hints that the next pardon he issues may have his own name on it. That's next. We have the meat. So you need five dollars over cost special, or you pay only five dollars over our cost. Wall. I want to cry. I really want to cry. Argentina's gone. Argentina died today. At every Champions League match, a minute silence was held in his memory. The latest generation of players and coaches saying goodbye to one of the greats. He made the world football better. His performance in, uh, you know, we had done in Napoli, a team for the South, and uh, especially with national team in Argentina, Mexico, 86, was something unbelievable. In Naples, in Barcelona, they grieved. But it's here, in Argentina, where the pain is felt the deepest. World football has lost a legend. But this country has lost one of its favorite sons. Natalio Cosoy, BBC News, Buenos Aires. But of course, not just Argentina. Diego Maradona led the Italian club Naples, Napoli, to its first two league titles. Speaking to me from Milan railway station as he was about to board a train to Naples, Italian sports journalist Tancredi Palmeri told me about the veneration in which Maradona is still held three decades after he left the club. I can first show you uh, these front page one of the many of Gazzetta dello Sport, uh, all the front page of Italian people today are dedicated to Maradona, probably the sport people even more, is saying, ho visto Maradona, I saw Maradona, from the most famous chant of Napoli fans dedicated to uh, Diego Armando Maradona. But see, the sport side doesn't explain uh, enough or exactly about Maradona. We are talking about an iconoclast that became an icon. Uh, someone that was much more than only the titles that he won. That in the end weren't even that much. Two Italian titles, one World Cup, even though as a full protagonist, 
But as you were mentioning, uh, Napoli is the largest, the third largest city in Italy, completely mad for football. Until the moment he arrived, never won anything, not even a single title. But it's not only about that. Napoli, as Argentina, as Buenos Aires, was part of the, uh, let's say, south of the world. Um, since the unity of Italy in the 19th century, in spite of being the third largest city, uh, was disadvantaged economically, socially, culturally. Uh, the way that Napoli not only had beaten on the pitch the great team from northern Italy, Milan, Continuous dominance, it's an all-new Friday Night Smackdown, live at 8 Eastern on Fox. Wall surface you're working with. Uh They're still working. My family and C-SPAN, that keeps it real. That's Stephanie Ashburn, Virginia. You bring up uh, President-elect Joe Biden. He gave a Thanksgiving address yesterday uh, from Wilmington, uh, part of his effort uh, to offer his vision uh, for what a Biden administration will look like. Here's a bit of the President-elect. Here's the America I see. And I believe it's the America you see as well. America that faces facts. An America that overcomes challenges. An America that we, where we seek justice and equality for all people. An America that holds fast to the conviction that out of pain comes possibility, out of frustration comes progress, and out of division, unity. You all know in our finest hours, that's who we've always been, and that's who we shall be again. For I believe that this grim season of division demonization is going to give way to a year of light and of unity. Why do I think so? Because America is a nation not of adversaries but of neighbors. Not of limitations but of possibilities. Not of dreams deferred but of dreams realized. I've said many times that this is a great country. We are a good people. This is the United States of America. And there's never been anything we've been unable to do when we've done it together. Think of what we come through as a nation. How many things we've come through? Centuries of human enslavement, cataclysmic civil war, exclusion of women from the battle box, world wars, Jim Crow, the long twilight struggle against Soviet tyranny that could have ended not in the fall of the Berlin Wall, but in nuclear Armageddon. Look, I'm not naive. I know that history is just that, history. But to know what came before, what's come before, what's happened before, can help arm us against despair. Knowing that previous generations got through the same universal human challenge that we face, the tension between selfishness and generosity, between fear and hope, between division and unity. And what, what was it that brought the reality of America into closer alignment with the promise of reality, justice, and prosperity? Sounds corny, but it was love, plain and simple. Love of country. Love of one another. We don't talk much about love in our politics. The political, the political arena is too loud, too angry, too heated. To love our neighbor as ourselves is a radical act. It is what we're called to do. Joe Biden yesterday in Delaware, taking your phone calls on this Thanksgiving morning. Joy is in Philadelphia. Good morning. You're on the air. Good morning. Uh, I uh, want to be thankful for, uh, actually, I want to be thankful for the doctors and nurses that really um, changing their, their holiday to take care of a lot of the sick people. Um, I, I don't think people realize that, uh, and they don't think about those doctors and nurses uh, uh, taking care of everyone. And now we might not, a lot of hospitals don't have 
the space. They don't have the bed to take care of people. And they're telling them not to travel. Not They tell them not to travel. And, and, and I look at the airport, and people still are traveling. And and we, we, all, we have a lot to be thankful for. Um, I'm thankful that Joe Biden did win the, the election, and I would hope that the Trump voters would just support him because um, I, I really think that he, he, he's sincere and wants to be a good president. Joy, on this program yesterday when, when we were having this conversation, uh, there were Trump supporters who said uh, that Democrats didn't get over 2016. Why uh, should should they support Joe Biden now? Why should they get over the results of 2020? What would you say to those folks? Well, I would say to them, let's go back to uh, 2016. Uh, Russia was involved in the election. The election was very flawed. They really did a job on Hillary. They did a job on Hillary. Facebook. I just I went back and looked at something. In fact, I I, I even uh, got off of my Facebook. In fact, I never was on Facebook. They always try to get me to sign up. But after I start hearing from different people about all these bogus stories that Facebook had in 2016, look, they did a job on Hillary. You know, so uh, there was, and that's 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 what that's why Flynn. And all of them. That's that's why all of this is coming up from 2016. So people need to go back. But after 2016, I mean, we lived through four years of basically a showman. I really think we should just move on because even in this in this election, if you look, there was. I mean. Uh, it was other places where Trump tried to take the election with the joy, with Kanye West, with uh, Fox News. I mean, come on, he had a whole propaganda channel going for him. That's Joy in Pennsylvania this morning. Joy uh, started talking about uh, doctors and nurses and uh, dealing with uh, the ongoing spiking coronavirus pandemic. Uh, here's the latest numbers just from yesterday. Uh, the United States yesterday recorded more than 2,200 new deaths, the highest single-day increase since May the 6th. The figure kept the seven-day average of deaths above 1,600, a figure comparable to that during the first spike in cases and fatalities that brought uh, the U.S. death toll now to more than 261,000. On Wednesday alone, the United States recorded 185,000 new coronavirus cases, uh, a figure that the Washington Post notes dwarfs the daily number from May when the high point uh, that uh, the United States recorded back then was a little more than 33,000 new cases in a single day. Uh, and then when it comes to hospitalizations, uh, at about 7 p.m. yesterday, total hospitalizations in this country stood at more than 89,000. That also a record. To the Sooner State, this is David in Medill. Good morning. You're next. Good morning, y'all. Hey, uh, I'm thankful that people had an idea to start this country. Uh, I've got a request that y'all try to have a program about respect, if you could. Uh, that's a loose word, but a lot of people seem to use that word, and I guess it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, so I'd like to re recite a, my Thanksgiving poem, if it would be all right. Go ahead, David. Okay. It's called God Bless of America. <laughs> okay, uh, do we ever stop and think about our freedom here today? We've heard the praise so many times. God bless the USA. Do we stop to think about our country's pioneers, the ones who came across the sea, their troubles and their fears? They brought someone who they could trust to rule this new land. They based their life on freedom. For God, they made their stand. They said to him, there would always be abundance in this land. Sickness bread, hunger came. They did not lose their faith. For God had brought them over here, and he would not turn away. Well, I'm so glad they stayed here. 
and carried out God's plan. If they would have turned back, who would have came to this land? Who knows it might be Russia, China, or Iran. Thank God we call America the eagle who flies free. We don't trust communists, but God who lives in me. One more thought before I stop. God made this world you see. He could have put us in his place, but he put us where we are free. Americans, please take a look at the world outside and say how our country started. God does bless the USA. And I think that's how it is. David, thank you. Thanks for sharing that poem. How long did it take you to write that, David? Oh, I, I wrote that back in like 87 uh, when I lived in Fort Smith, Arkansas. I'm, I'm the poem writer and uh, it, I just, that, that's my, I've always been a pastor guy. Uh, my dad was a war II veteran and I'm the only one out of uh, 11 kids who served in the military. I, I'm a, a no war veteran. And my dad was the only one out of 10 kids who served in his family. Uh, I don't know, that's just something that gets into the God and that, that American flag, but hey, we're all America. David, thanks for sharing that this morning. You talked about respect. I'd encourage you to stick around. We're going to have a segment uh, today uh, talking about uh, the political divide in this country, but focused on, on efforts to heal it, uh, to talk across the political divide, to talk about respect. Um, that's at 8.45 Eastern this morning. We'll be joined by Dave Isay, uh, founder and president of StoryCorps. Uh, so we'll talk more about his efforts a little later this morning. Hope you stick around for that uh, coming up in about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Of about $1.2 million in modern day dollars from a Giving, keep it small, uninvite them. Brown told people to call police on anyone violating restrictions. And how about this? Congresswoman elect Lauren Bobert finds a way around COVID 19 restrictions. The Colorado Republican telling Fox News she's having a funeral for a dead turkey so she can have more people at her home. The state limited Thanksgiving gatherings to 10 people but allows 30 people at funerals. Griff. All right, thanks, Julian. Well, NASCAR driver Haley Deegan using her skills behind the wheel to bring America together and help families in need this Thanksgiving. The 19-year-old racing star partnered with Ford to deliver more than 3,000 pounds of turkey. That's a ton and a half of food to food banks around Detroit, feeding more than 250 families today. Haley Deegan joins us now. Haley, happy Thanksgiving to you. Yes, happy Thanksgiving to you too. Hey, listen, so tell us what you did. This was an amazing feed. You drove a lot of turkeys to a lot of families. Yeah, so last week uh, I flew to Detroit, and I've been wanting to do a lot more with the community, giving back to the community, and that's something me and Ford both agreed that we wanted to do. So we worked together, and we were able to put a lot of smiles on families' faces, and that's something that I've been definitely wanting to do more, and I think it's really important to give back to your community, whether it's in a small way or a big way, as in 250 turkeys. I love the uh, logo on your truck, uh, Haley's Holiday Hall. What's been the reaction? Everyone's been super excited. It was just, I'm not even looking for the reaction of the people around, but just the people who were getting the turkeys. It was amazing to see just the smiles it put on their faces and the happiness it brought them and how thankful they were for it and seeing all the kids get excited. And so that's something that I just appreciated so much. And it really was an eye opener for me. That's something as simple as a turkey that we could take for granted, how much happiness it brought them. You say it was an eye-opener, Haley. Is this your first experience doing something like this, and what's it meant to you? It's definitely been one of the big, bigger experiences that I've had, but I'm super thankful that I'm getting more into it, and I definitely want to do more stuff in the future. All right, Haley, I got to ask you, because I follow NASCAR, and I remember it's hard to believe it was this year, but way back in February, Daytona 500, you had tweeted you wanted to get your helmet signed by President Trump. Of course, the president went. He drove the beast around the track at Daytona. Uh, what was it like to meet the president, get your helmet signed, and what are your thoughts today? That was a crazy experience. I didn't even know if I was going to pull it off. I'm 
literally just made that tweet. Donald Trump Jr. ended up reaching out to me. Um, we connected and we kind of uh, figured it all out, the details and stuff. They're like, hey, we got to take your helmet and everything, make sure it passes. And so they did that. They took my helmet for the day. I was walking around the Daytona 500 with my helmet all day. <laughs> and I ended up being able to meet him, his wife, and Donald Trump Jr. And uh, pretty much like the whole family that was there. And it was a cool experience because not many people get experience of uh, meeting the president uh, in their lifetime. So just to be able to say I was able to do that was just so awesome. What did he say to you, the president? He asked first how I did in the race. And I told him I ended up getting second. And first he asked if I raced, and I was like, yes, I do race. Uh, I, this is my helmet right here, and then I asked him to sign it. But it was it was cool how much interest he took into it and how many questions he was asking. And he was super personable and just a real good, true human being and having real conversation. I hope you told him you were the Camping World Truck Series Rookie of the Year at 19 years old. <laughs> yeah, so uh, that was definitely at the beginning of the year, so I didn't have that title yet. But uh, we definitely have had a lot of success through our racing career in this last year. We've got a lot of things accomplished, and we're going on to bigger things in the future. Well, we look forward to it. We wish you well, Haley, and congratulations. Well done on Haley's Holiday Hall delivering those turkeys. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you, you too. All right, Haley Deegan, what a star. Still ahead, Denver's mayor now apologizing for telling residents to avoid travel this Thanksgiving. Then he immediately hopped on a flight. Lawrence Jones reacts to a growing number of Democrats. Do as I say, not as I do approach. That's next. But first, grab a copy of our own Peter Hexeth's new book, Modern Warriors, which is out now. You don't want to miss reading this. If you have any idea what it's like to be in a battle zone, it's all laid out by the men and women that fight it. And your brand. Get relief now without a prescription. Uh, if you could just leave by the time I get back, that'd be great. God bless America and the Raiders. Oh, so nice. Cinnamon swirl. Gotta love that. Yeah. Well, those are some of our servicemen and women overseas giving a holiday shout out to folks back home. Welcome back to CBS This Morning. Last week, the Pentagon announced plans to bring back thousands of U.S. troops from Iraq and Afghanistan. The U.S. is expected to withdraw about 500 of the 3,000 troops currently based in Iraq. About 1,000 are still serving in Syria. Holly Williams is traveling with the service members stationed in both countries to see how they are spending this Thanksgiving amid the pandemic. For many serving in the Middle East, there'll be no festive Thanksgiving lunch today. Instead, they're practicing strict social distancing with takeout meals. On this base in northern Iraq, over a hundred service members have been infected with COVID. But specialist Sharif Tajani Abimbola, a mechanic who services Apache attack helicopters, told us there's still plenty to feel thankful for. I just love the uniform. I love the respect. I love when they call you, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. I love when people just respect you. TJ, as he's known here, came to the US from Nigeria four years ago, then enlisted yeah, and said he go. plans to become a US citizen when this tour of duty is over. I'm feeling grateful that uh, I'm, uh, I'm on the path to make a better life for my family, uh, to make a better future for my child. The base's chief medical officer is Commander Chris Call, an anesthesiologist from Walter Reed Medical Center who thought he was coming here to treat combat injuries. It's exactly like our ICU, we have the same equipment. Instead, he's been setting up quarantine wards. COVID has really united us as a humanity on this base, as opposed to all of our individual units. It's really, in a lot of ways, brought us together in a way that I never could have imagined. Across the border in Syria, at this small camp in the desert, specialist Jesse Shatilov from Tulsa, Oklahoma, is in charge of making I sure there's running like water for the troops here. She was inspired to join up by her grandfather, who served in Vietnam, and sent this message to her four-year-old son, Victor, who she hasn't seen in five months. I love you. I miss you. Mom will be home soon. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> And out on patrol in Syrian towns and villages, 
Sergeant William Mills, a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne Division who hails from Maryland, told us that at a time when he's missing his family, he's grateful for moments like these with local children. It kind of takes your mind elsewhere. Uh, you know, you kind of forget like the situation you're in. It's nice to kind of, you know, just relax and hang out. Being thousands of miles from home in the midst of a pandemic has given some here a new perspective on what it means to be thankful. For CBS This Morning, Holly Williams in Syria. And we salute our fighting men and women in uniform all over the world, serving to keep us safe. Yes, we do. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to them. Ahead, alternative social media sites are attracting millions of new users after the election, but critics say apps like Parler are not doing enough to filter misinformation. We'll show you what's behind those concerns. And a reminder, you can always get the morning's news by subscribing to the CBS This Morning podcast. Here are today's top stories in less than 20 minutes. Gail likes to say that's a deal. It's a deal. It's a deal. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> Again, thankful to be home with my husband and my children. I would love for people to realize it does need to be taken very seriously. Um, my grandmother would love for me to give thanks to one of the pastors who prayed for me over the phone. However, um, at his church, she says, nobody's wearing masks. So that's, um, of course, now, especially more than ever, a big no-no for me. That's yeah, not somewhere that I want to put myself in at risk of going back down. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm just thankful to be home, thankful to be with my family, and to know that I'm able to be here this Thanksgiving. I, I had a... Um, one night where a toy therapist had told me, hey, nice to see you late. You're looking great. You know, we thought you weren't going to make it out of here unless you were in a wooden box. And it was kind of like, thanks, I think. <laughs> Not quite sure how to respond to that one. Yeah. But it was confirmed many times that a lot of the staff really thought I was not going to make it out. Well, you are a miracle. I mean, you're a, I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. You're, yeah, it's a miracle that you made it after being intubated for so long and being so sick and being so close to death. And so, of course, I understand why you want the church and everybody in the church to be able to wear a mask. I should also just mention that you guys have a GoFundMe page, um, the Gutierrez GoFundMe page. I'll, I will... Um, put it out on, on my social media as well. Obviously, this has been devastating um, financially for you guys and for you having to care, Rafael, for all of the kids alone and all that stuff. Um, so I hope that people can help. And we really appreciate you guys. We're thinking of you, and we hope that you have, um, obviously, a memorable Thanksgiving and a really healthy and special one. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for hearing us out. Absolutely. What an incredible story. We also want to remember some of the more than 262,000 Americans lost to coronavirus. 43-year-old Natasha Benton was a hardworking activist for social justice in Lexington, Kentucky, who faced many challenges of her own. Benton endured two strokes, two kidney transplants, two hip replacements. Friends tell the New York Times, through it all, though, she kept a smile that lit up a room. 71-year-old Rita Ammons taught kids with special needs in Spencer, North Carolina. The Salisbury Post reports she was known for crafty creativity in decorating her classroom. Friends say she was the kind of person who would drop everything to help. To call Canton, Michigan security guard Don Lucas beloved might be an understatement. His ability to lift students up with his inspirational words led a high school senior to call him one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. Well, now that student tells CNN affiliate WDIV, it's our job to be the Don and to spread that love and kindness. We'll be right back. She blew up the idea of what a first lady is supposed to be. She was 
the most trusted advisor he had. Without her, he would never have been president. First Ladies, back-to-back -back episodes, tomorrow at 9 on CNN. Hi from Memorial Lutheran Church. It's good to see they're still making it happen. The volunteers out there, even though things had to be different this year. Well, stay with us. Aaron Dowden will join us with a look at that forecast when we come back. The First Alert Weather Team, only on Dakota News Now. There's a net... And across county lines. themselves. Just because I say I want to be pardoned ahead of time, how, how does that work? It's Tom in California. Back to the Keystone State. This is Robin in Old Forge. Good morning. Hi. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'm thankful for my family, for my friends. I'm thankful that our family hasn't caught in the virus. I had neighbors die from it, which I was really devastated over. And I'm thankful that we have President Trump for the last four years. And I think Joe Biden is going back to the Obama years. And Obama came on TV and talking about the Hispanics voting for Trump. Here we go. And now you have callers calling. They won the election, the Democrats, and they're still calling and, and talking about Trump. And they want us Trump voters to accept Joe Biden. In this house, it's never going to happen. Pennsylvania, I'm in Oak Ridge. Everybody in Oak Ridge wanted Trump. And Pennsylvania is the most crooked state for voting I've ever seen. But God bless everybody. Have a nice Thanksgiving and enjoy your President Biden because he's not my president. Thank you. President-elect Biden uh, gave that speech yesterday from Wilmington, Delaware. Meanwhile, uh, his vice president-elect Kamala Harris uh, in D.C. yesterday uh, visiting the D.C. Central Kitchen, one of those food banks here in Washington, D.C. Uh, when she did that, uh, she took some time to speak briefly with the uh, reporters who had gathered. Here's a bit of what she had to say yesterday. Said this morning that you had made contact with Republicans on the Hill. Does that include Leader McConnell? Um, I can't speak directly to that, but I will tell you that it has been the priority for the president-elect and me from the beginning that we intend to and will work across the aisle to deal with these most intractable issues that are affecting people regardless of who they voted for in the election. And I can tell you that, that the president-elect and I take that very seriously. You know, I'm here to talk with folks who are feeding the hungry. Uh, you may have heard me say one in six families in America is describing their children as being hungry. One in, in five are describing an inability to pay rent. These are real issues, and the folks that we are talking about, whoever they voted for, deserve to have leadership that sees them through the lens of, of the life they are living, regardless of their party affiliation, and we feel very strongly about that. Senator and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris uh, yesterday at DC's Central Kitchen. Back to your phone calls on this Thanksgiving morning. Tom is in Foley, Alabama. Good morning. You're next. Uh, good morning and Thanksgiving. Um, I'd like to uh, just point out a few things. I'm a civil man, retired. I have no high school education whatsoever, but I made it through to retirement, 30 years of work. How is it possible that we change our election laws months before the election and we have millions more votes than four years ago? It's, it's just baffling to me. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm not a real educated man, but I, I know how to do a little math. Something's awry, something's afoot. I have friends from Mexico to El Salvador, immigrants, of course, they came here when they were young just to get a job. They send their money back. These are family people. And I know this is what they believe. Why would anybody want to leave somewhere else to come to America if everywhere else is so great? America is great for one reason. Everybody has a chance in this life. And I'd just like to leave you all with that. Thanks. Tom in Alabama. This is Brilly in Brookshire, Texas. Good morning. You're next. 
Good morning and happy Thanksgiving and Lord bless you. I am thankful for this nation, one nation under God. That's what I'm thankful for and I'm thankful for my family and I'm thankful for the president that we have that God has given us over these four years and I am praying that God is going to work all of this out because the I believe that the Democratic Party really stole the election because they have always been thieves and murderers. That's my happiness, and God bless you. That's brilliant in Texas. This is David in Flint, Michigan. Uh, Flint, Michigan. Good morning. You're next. Good morning. Uh, good morning, C-SPAN. I am. So, I'm watching on the TV while I'm in here. Uh, I'm just, I'm just thankful to be alive on uh, Thanksgiving Day because I'm over 65. I'm 67, and God has blessed me to make it through this pandemic. And I'm I'm even more excited about we have a decent, honest Christian president now, and it's going to make my Christmas happy. It's going to make my New Year's happy. I believe that America can start finally. Uh, the races can start to coming back together and showing love. And um, I just think it's just a blessing that Satan was defeated and that we can move forward together, you know, just like Biden said, together. And I'm just even ex more excited that all the metro areas throughout Michigan combined to put uh, Biden over in Michigan by a whopping 150,000 people. So I'm just excited. Thank you. That's David Flint, Michigan. A few more comments from our tech. You know, the realm of respectability and also aggression. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, take notes on that, you guys. Thank you, Jillian. That was sort of hilarious. Awesome. All right, Adam Klotz, what do you have for us in the way of weather today? Hey, good morning, guys. You know, there's a lot to be thankful if you look across the country. Fairly quiet weather. Uh, there's a cold front. This is the only spot we're really kind of paying attention to. Temperatures out in front of 50s and 60s, back behind a little bit cooler. Anytime we talk about a cold front, though, that is going to be where there's at least a little bit of weather activity. Right now, rain up and down the East Coast. Moving fairly quick. If you're in the mid-Atlantic, it's going to be out by uh, early afternoon hours. If you are in New England, this is going to be lingering through most of the day. But on the back side of this system, it is looking really good across the country. Temp they are setting up their businesses and thinking about what business looks like under a President Biden. Um, now, that's, it's a different story for the economy. The economy is very much still stuck in where we are right now. We got some really discouraging economic data yesterday uh, about the state of employment in this country. And um, that is something that President-elect Biden will have to deal with on day one. Yeah, it's significantly up from what economists thought it would be reporting in at. Uh, we're going to get to those numbers here in just a minute as well. Uh, but that's speaking of the Trump election fight, I want to play with you these sharp contrasting messages that we got yesterday from the president and the president-elect. Listen in. Our democracy was tested this year. And what we learned is this. The people of this nation are up to the task. In America, we have full and fair and free elections. And then we honor the results. The election was rigged and we can't let that happen. We can't let it happen for our country. And this election has to be turned around. All right, that's quite the contrast there. The initial uh, words coming in after it was clear that the Biden administration, or at least the incoming Biden administration, was going to take over was that this might complicate his ability to do that. Several weeks out now, do you feel that that's still the case? Or is it a quaint notion at this point, given the deep divisions in this country, that there is any working together before Biden takes over on January 21st, 2021? This has been Biden's message throughout the campaign, that he can bring the country together. He's never wavered from that message. He's sticking with it now. Huge contrast to that, that scene that, that you just showed of you know, President Trump being, being reduced to sort of being a voice on somebody's cell phone in the middle of this uh, partisan hearing, the, the leader of the free world. The, the contrast could not be greater. But you know, look, Corey, I, I, I don't think anybody has any illusions that by Joe Biden just saying it's time to unify that that's going to happen automatically. 
that the country's very divided. It's been very divided for many years now. President Trump has really sort of staked his political capital on making that division even broader and sort of being president of his own base rather than the whole country. He's also spent the last several weeks uh, debasing the uh, results of the election, saying those words, it's rigged, it's, it's, it's false. So mm -hmm. there's gonna be a lot of people in the country, a lot of Trump supporters who uh, go into the Biden administration thinking it is not legitimate. So Joe Biden is gonna have a lot of work to do in his actions, not just his words, to try to make that unity that he says that he's capable of doing. It's gonna be a tall order, but with the pandemic and the economic collapse and all the many challenges this country faces, this is the message that he's gonna stick with and, and we'll see if he's successful. And Courtney, really quickly, I think one of the other concerning things is the headline that came out about Fed Chair Janet Yellen being picked for Treasury Secretary, but then also having some trouble because of some moves by Steve Mnuchin that could make her job more difficult. What do you have on that reporting wise? Yeah, there is a lot of concern uh, on Wall Street and uh, from folks who watch the economy about what's going to happen when, uh, if and when Janet Yellen is confirmed for Treasury Secretary. We know that Congress is kind of stuck on a next stimulus package. So a lot of attention has turned to the Federal Reserve and what the Federal Reserve can do to kind of support the economy while Congress and the White House hash out a deal. Uh, the moves that Secretary, current Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin has made would essentially make it more difficult for the Federal Reserve to uh, implement some emergency economic programs should they choose to do so. Um, and so that's something that uh, we're definitely going to need to watch. There's still a lot of questions uh, about you know, what exactly the ramifications are of um, Secretary Mnuchin's actions. Yeah, Democrats are gonna need access to uh, those funds if they wanna continue to have um, some of the programs in place for people who need help uh, as the pandemic continues. And we know that two key programs are up in December. We'll be watching that closely. Meredith McGraw, Courtney Brown, and Beth Bowie, thank you all this morning. We appreciate you. And when we return, a look inside new cutting edge, low cost COVID-19 testing that could get students around the world safely back into classrooms. Some people have joint pain, plus have high blood pressure. I love saying that word, butterball, since 1981. <laughs> and this year, they will be doing it virtually from home. Say it to yourself, butterball. They are all on hand to dish out any advice to help you deliver a delicious meal. Butterball says... <laughs> Since most families won't be getting together due to the pandemic, they are expecting lots of first-time cooks in the kitchen. So, Butterball, Michelle Miller's calling you. You're such a Butterball. You have a party of a party of six, right? A party of six, five. No, but six. Oh, you want to go? That would be fun. Michelle didn't get it. She's like, wait, you want, you want to come over? Uh, all right, check this out. A teenager from Ireland built a replica of Manhattan out of Legos, and it is mind blowing. Watch this. Alex Bailey used the toy blocks for his six foot. Oh, wow. I know. Recreation um, of the greatest city on earth. Wow. The year old said it took him about seven days to design it. He's still building it. He was inspired after he went on a helicopter ride over Manhattan with his family last Christmas. Oh, my goodness. My I really want to be an architect. And the, just the buildings and everything, I was just amazed by them. I, was just, I always loved them so much. And I just thought, wow, like, I hope to design one of those when I'm older. Wants to be an architect. His creation has been a hit since it was posted online, racking up more than two and a half million views. I say wow. he has a career. Wow. I think so. the Lincoln Lodge. It says that, look, when he was two, he started building, and then at age seven, he built a three foot Lego Titanic ship. Have you ever wow. focused on anything no. like that in that great of a No, but I'm telling you, my son was big on Legos. He loved them. Go right. ahead. What may be the new normal for millions of American families? Young adults tell us what it's like to live with their parents again after years of independence. <laughs> Welcome home. Today's What to Watch is sponsored by Toyota with everything she needs for her and her two teenage daughters. It's just a relief that I don't have to purchase all of that. Over 50 million Americans like Regina won't have enough to eat in 2020 in part because of the pandemic. Feeding America, the largest hunger relief group in the U.S., projects that 8 billion meals will be needed in the next year to feed food insecure Americans. About 40% of the people who right now are turning to food banks for help around the country are who 
people who never before relied upon the charitable food system. Onion. Regina is out of a job. Her car was totaled months ago, and she's not receiving unemployment. She now relies on a once a week delivery from the food pantry. Day to day, is your pantry stocked, or what does it look like day to day? You just survive it. That's all I can say. You just have to survive it. The 15th Congressional District here in the Bronx has the highest food insecurity rate among children in the country. At Agatha House, they're hoping to take the stigma out of needing a little extra help. We have to look in, and try to imagine ourselves in the position. What we would want for ourselves, not just to give them a cardboard box, but to make them feel loved, special. This small operation says it's seen a 100% increase in need. Even with the little that they get, hopefully they, there's someone in their building or one of their neighbors that they can invite for a plate of food. Yes, gotta give Miss Mamie some stuff. Despite her struggles to put food on the table, you welcome, Miss Mamie. Regina is sharing what she has with her neighbor and remains grateful for this Thanksgiving. Even if we didn't get the Agatha house or we were just having regular chicken every day, just to say that you was alive to eat it, that's a blessing in itself. Now, one of the ways that these food banks have been able to meet this increased demand is actually through the kindness of other Americans, through donations. But there's a concern that as this holiday season passes, Americans will begin to forget that this need is there. And Erica, volunteers have been so key to putting on these massive food distributions. There's also a concern that as these COVID cases continue to spike across the country, volunteers will be scared to turn out in a time when they're needed most. But obviously, there is something Americans to do, can do during this time to help others, donating their time or money to help feed other hungry Americans. Erica? Yeah, absolutely. And so important to have that reminder. Vanessa, thank you. Joining me now is Kyle Wade. He's the president and CEO of the Atlanta Community Food Bank. Uh, Kyle, good to have you with us today. I want to pick on pick up on, on what Vanessa left off with there, right? We are seeing such an increase in need. And I was reading... 50% of the people that you're seeing now in Atlanta have never needed food help before. What has changed? Is this all pandemic related? Well, Erica, thank you for having me and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, the pandemic has, has uh, led to what we think is the greatest domestic hunger crisis in our country in nearly a century. Uh, it has uh, clearly disrupted uh, the lives and finances for so many of our neighbors. Uh, and we're seeing people who used to be the volunteers handing out food at food distributions are now the people in line for, the, for that same assistance. Uh, uh, we know that there are at least 30% more people in our community who are facing food insecurity. Uh, and at the food bank, we're doing everything we can to feed more people. We've grown our distribution by 70% compared to what we were doing prior to the pandemic. Uh, and we know that we're gonna have to continue doing that because uh, we are by no means out of the woods yet. How do you sustain that need? How do you continue to meet that need? Well, uh, that's a great question. We've been very generously supported by the community. Uh, we've received uh, tremendous uh, food supply support from our food donor partners and from federal stimulus resources. Uh, to sustain it, we're gonna continue to need financial support uh, from the community. Uh, and we're gonna need Congress and the federal government to take action to authorize additional stimulus funding. That's really important uh, that we get more stimulus resources to families and businesses and food banks so that we can keep our community solid uh, until this crisis really abates. You know, in terms of Congress getting that message, uh, Vanessa has been doing such wonderful reporting for us over the last several weeks just talking about this need and the growing need. And we are seeing the pictures every day and we are hearing from people in those lines. We're hearing from people like you who are running the food distribution, and yet we're getting silence out of Washington. I mean, are, are you confident that you're actually going to get some help? And if so, when do you see that coming? Well, we, we, we expect that there will be additional action taken. We're not sure when that will happen um, or how quickly it will happen or at what scale. Uh, I think, you know, hunger is not 
a partisan issue. It is a uh, community and a country issue, and, and we, uh, we need that support, not just food banks, but uh, families and businesses in order to keep our economy uh, on a stable footing in order to keep our families in a position where they can emerge from this crisis uh, in a better place, uh, we need Congress to take action. So we're certainly having conversations with our delegation uh, in Georgia. We encourage your viewers to have that same conversation uh, because together, you know, if we provide the resources we need right now, uh, we can really blunt this uh, crisis and emerge stronger than we were before. And, and I think it's important to point out, you know, we talk about this every year at the holidays and we talk about you know, the need at the holidays, but this is a need uh, that is there year round. Uh, it is not just tied to a turkey on Thanksgiving and certainly not these days. Um, can you just put that in perspective for us, what things have been like for you over the last several months, not just this week? So uh, this has been um, uh, unlike any crisis we've ever experienced at the food bank. Uh, we, uh, as I said, have grown our food distribution by 70%. We, uh, in the month of uh, October, distributed 12 million pounds of food in a single month, significantly more than we've ever distributed. Uh, and so we've just been working around the clock to get as much food out to as many people as we can in as many places. Uh, and what's most important to know is that uh, this crisis is far from over. We're going to see ex elevated levels of demand for many months yet to come. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, this crisis has always been with us. Even when the pandemic recedes, there's still going to be many people left behind who still face food insecurity. And one of the things I hope that we learn through this crisis is that the crisis has always been there, but working together, we can end it. Yeah, and, and we all have the power to do that. Kyle Wade, thank you for everything you're doing today. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, to you and all your staff and volunteers. And for okay. more information about how you at home can get help or give it, just log on to CNN.com slash impact. New Day continues right now. This is New Day with Allison Camarada and John Berman. We want to welcome our viewers in the United States and all around the world. This is a special edition of New Day, as you can tell. Erica Hill is <laughs> in for John Berman making a special appearance on this Thanksgiving, it's great to have you here. It's nice to be with you for the Girl Power Edition. That's exactly right. Uh, the holiday, of course, will obviously look and feel very different this year. Nearly 90,000 Americans will spend Thanksgiving in the hospital. That's a record, and it's a record that has been broken every day for 16 straight days. More than 262,000 Americans have died. That's an unimaginable number of empty chairs at Thanksgiving tables today. 2,297 deaths were reported just yesterday. Health officials think all the signs are there that as bad as it is today, if we don't change our behavior, it will get worse by Christmas. Flynn, who pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI twice, Democrats outraged, but President-elect Biden urging unity in his own holiday message. I know the country has grown weary of the fight. We need to remember we're at war with a virus, not with one another, not with each other. Calling an audible, the NFL makes a last minute change to Thanksgiving football brought on by a new coronavirus outbreak among the Baltimore Ravens. The league now scrambling to get the numbers back under control in time for the weekend. We'll talk to their chief medical officer about that live. Ready, set, shop. Those infamous Black Friday crowds won't be the same this year, but don't worry, the deals are still very much on. We've got your preview and a game plan for the holiday sales you will not want to miss. Plus, marching on, the iconic floats and show-stopping performances keeping tradition alive at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We are live along the route with a front row seat to all the excitement ahead. Today, Thursday, November 26, 2020. From NBC News, this is Today with Savannah Guthrie and Hoda Kotb. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza. Hey guys.
guys. Hey guys, welcome to today. So happy that you are joining us. It's a Thursday morning. Happy Thanksgiving. Savannah and I are right here in Herald Square, right in front of Macy's. I cannot think of one place I would rather be <laughs> right now than right in this spot with you and waiting for the 94th Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It is happening. Uh, it kicks off about two hours from now. But Nothing is going to rain on this parade. Nothing. By the way, you know what? We like the rain, and they've been lining up. The floats are behind us there. They've been lining up since early morning, so you guys know it just is not Thanksgiving without our annual Thanksgiving Day Parade. Today's, we have to let you know, we'll look... Take a look at that bumper to bumper traffic in Los Angeles overnight, all of those headlights and taillights. This, of course, despite those CDC warnings to stay home. With nearly 90,000 Americans hospitalized, that's an all-time high for the 15th consecutive day. And as states struggle to get control of the virus, the Supreme Court ruling against COVID restrictions in New York, ruling in favor of religious groups and blocking New York's attendance limits in houses of worship. We have much more on that ahead. Well, we begin with the latest on that threat of Thanksgiving travel. Gio Benitez is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with more on that. Gio, good morning to you. Hey, well, good morning. Yeah, it has been a very busy travel week. And when it comes to the pandemic, airports have been breaking records. But still, the busiest travel day, it's still ahead. This morning, more than 5 million people hitting the skies since last Friday for Thanksgiving. More than 50 million expected to travel by car and plane. Some airports packed, despite that CDC warning to stay home. Some Americans, after enduring lockdowns for months, are looking for human connection this holiday season. Family is so important right now and having support and being there for one another. We just really need this hope and this connection right now. You just try to kind of be as safe as you can and get home and see family. But where are most people going? Not cities like New York or Los Angeles. Instead of people traveling to more major tourist destinations, we're seeing a lot of hometown cities start to rise in popularity. So places like Dallas, Philadelphia, Nashville are all topping the list this year compared to last year. TSA says the busiest airports right now, LAX, Orlando, and Hartsfield-Jackson in Atlanta. And the busiest travel day is still days away. Probably the busiest day of the entire weekend, not unusual for long weekends, uh, is going to be the Sunday, the return day. But those driving in the New York City area may end up at a COVID-19 checkpoint. The city targeting some bridges and crossings to enforce quarantine restrictions. Violators could face fines of up to $2,000. This as the number of coronavirus cases surge nationwide. The number of deaths rising to more than 2,300 a day. The CDC now projecting the U.S. could see more than 300,000 deaths by December 19th. The amount of loss that we have experienced, it's devastating. Still, some Americans aren't getting the message. In Ohio overnight, parking lots outside bars were packed on what is typically the biggest bar hopping night of the year. Wear a mask, social distance, and wash your hands. In Denver, Colorado, Mayor Michael Hancock advised residents to stay home, tweeting, avoid travel if you can. But 30 minutes later, he boarded a flight to visit family in Mississippi. And look, a lot of us feel isolated during this holiday season, but hope is on the horizon. Some health officials say that we can see the first vaccinations for COVID-19 by the end of next month. But this uh, very interesting concurring opinion from Justice Neil Gorsuch, who I think summed it up nicely, it is time, past time, to make plain that while the pandemic poses many grave challenges, there is no world in which the Constitution tolerates color-coded executive edicts that reopen liquor stores and bike shops, but shutter churches, synagogues, and mosques. What's your reaction to this ruling by the Supreme Court? It's a strong ruling. It, it, it tells you who right now is, is leading in the Supreme Court is really Justice Thomas. And, and you can see the conservatives are able to finally have a stronger voice. This is a message. I mean, Jason, let's, let's face it. We have seen governors across this country through fiat and executive privilege issuing mandates and ordering things that I never saw, I thought I'd see in my lifetime. So this is a message that needed to be sent. And I think judges all over the country are paying attention to the fact that we don't want to whittle away constitutional rights based on reaction, emotional reaction to the, to the virus. 
Brad, I'm being texted by at least one friend that works with the uh, religious liberties rights industry. This person tells me they think it's a positive ruling because of the strong language. You know, in this, they, they find that it was a, quote, very severe restriction on attendance at religious services in areas classified as red or orange zones. Do you think this is the beginning of something? I do. I think that uh, you know, there's there's many people that are talking about it, and they're realizing the dynamic of Justice Barrett and 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 what she brings to this. And I think the the ability for conservative interpretation uh, of the Constitution and its application. I think we'll see uh, rulings like this that we haven't for a long time. I think it's what conservatives have been hoping for, and and they have a lot of issues over the coming months to decide the campaign trail or something like that in the way that, that Trump sort of does. Um, but more so, he's he's chosen people that perhaps had a, you know, a deputy position in that same cabinet um, in prior administrations, in the Obama administration, for example. Um, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State uh, nomination comes to mind as somebody that's just very, very skilled in his department and is accepted broadly um, within the Democratic Party and is also somebody that, to, to Biden's earlier uh, stated commitment throughout not only just the general election but also the, the broader primary, was that he wanted to choose officials to surround himself with that would be ready to take the job on day one and just would be as prepared as his sort of immediate close inner circle was. And we're seeing that to start to unroll in the, in the people that he's announced so far. Yeah, you have talked about kind of that line he's trying to walk, trying to fend off pr pressure from progressives. NBC's Lester Holt asked him about that very thing. Listen in. What about um, former rivals from your own party, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren? Uh, have you talked to them about cabinet positions? Well, what I've, I've, I've talked to them. Look, as I said, the, we already have significant representation among progressives in our administration, but there's nothing really off the table. But one thing is really critical. Taking someone out of the Senate, taking someone out of the House, um, at a particularly a person of consequence, is a really difficult decision that would have to be made. I have a very ambitious, very progressive agenda, and it's going to take uh, really strong leaders in the House and Senate to get it done. Okay, so is that going to be uh, tough for him to not put as many progressives on the cabinet as, as the party might want? Is that going to be a problem for him? Well, I think that's an ongoing uh, an ongoing discussion and an ongoing potential conflict um, amongst some of the parties sort of left wing. But one thing, I did some reporting on this this past uh, few days. One thing that I found so far is at least that progressives are actually overwhelmingly um, sort of main figurehead progressives who are leading these movements, um, everything from grassroots to elected officials, tend to be quite happy with the initial uh, choices that he's made. I think in particular, um, Janet Yellen is somebody that uh, was a favorite of Elizabeth Warren's, the former Federal Reserve Chair, um, now now expected to lead the Treasury, if confirmed. So there, there's there's these people that are sort of um, very skilled in their areas of expertise, but also strategically on the Biden's end, not uh, not inflaming the left or not sort of. Um, starting a, a, a tribal war of, of sorts um, earlier than necessary. But I think it's something that's going to be worth watching as, as these nominations continue to roll out because the left has made a, a, several of their priorities very clear and they have listed several people already as sort of um, no-goes in terms of who they don't want to see. So it's going to be interesting to follow that. Yeah, and having to walk that line, no matter who, whether it's Republicans or Democrats that have control of that Senate, you still need support from every single one of the Democrats because that line would be tight, even if the incoming races in Georgia are won by the Democrats. Ali Vitale, Carol Lee, and Hannah Trudeau, thanks for coming back with us this morning. And Andy Dalton coming back and finding ways to complete passes to those outstanding playmakers, and then those playmakers making improbable plays. I think that is something that you can't always rely on, but you should be able to get that from week to week, every now and then from the Cowboys. So they look a lot better than they've looked pre in previous uh, games, but I don't trust the green. Well, I mean, look, again, to, to get to four and seven in first place in the division, you only have to trust them <laughs> so much. Uh, the Bart, and we were talking earlier this morning, a lot of this is about the quarterback for you. Yeah, you know I mean, when, when Andy Dalton's at his best, he's a competent quarterback. He's a guy that's above a game. Six-volt Chevy Silverado right on in-store and...
Um, but the decisions that are being made right now, I hope that there are many individuals who will enjoy this holiday virtually uh, with people outside of their homes. These, these decisions really do matter because the virus does need people to move through. Um, but I am confident that, American, that America will turn this around, confident. Um, I want to ask you about a little bit of CNN reporting, and that is that the White House, President Trump, is considering lifting the travel restrictions from Europe to the U.S. And it's interesting because, I mean, one of what President Trump has made sound as if it's his crowning achievement during trying to combat this virus was the travel restrictions that he put in place at the end of January on China. And so do you understand now why, while this is raging in the U.S., while we're seeing cases spike in places in Europe, why he would now lift the travel restrictions? Well, I, I can't comment specifically on, on, on what the policies would be in the U.S., but what I can say is for travel is that there really is no zero risk at the moment as it relates to travel. Um, there have been many ways in which traveling has been de-risked or, uh, or the, the different stages from leaving your home through the, the way that you travel to your destination. Um, we've reduced risk in terms of exposure and in terms of infection, in terms of transmission, but there is no zero risk at the moment. Um, what many countries are considering in terms of lifting travel is looking at the destination you're traveling from to the destination you're traveling to, um, looking at the, the intensity of transmission in each of those locations, looking at the, um, the capacities in the countries to be able to detect a case, to be able to care for that case and carry out contact tracing and the points of arrival. Um, but it really does depend. I mean, the thing that I would ask everyone is at the moment, um, you know, depending on where you live globally, because the situation is so different in many parts of the world, is, is it essential travel? You know, do you need to, tra to travel right now or can it be postponed? Um, and if you can, and if you do need to travel, do this in a way that minimizes your risk going forward. But I think we have a lot to learn about how we are going to um, start to, to, to resume safe travel, but there are so many factors to consider when making those policies. Yeah. I'm Maria Van Kerko. Thank you. Thank you, dermatologist, about Sky Racing. This year we got creative with our dollars. But with Walmart's low prices, you still know how... Now, overnight, some breaking news out of the U.S. Supreme Court. The court issued an injunction blocking New York's governor from enforcing 10 and 25 person occupancy limits on religious institutions. In an unsigned majority opinion, the court said the restrictions would violate religious freedom, Craig. All right. Get good chairs for us there here in New York. Gabe, thank you. In a Thanksgiving address on Wednesday, President elect Joe Biden looking forward and asking the nation to come together to fight COVID. Meanwhile, President Trump looking back at the election results and now granting a full pardon to his former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, who twice pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI. NBC White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins us now with more on all of that. Kelly, good morning and happy Thanksgiving. To you as well, Chanel. Good morning. Michael Flynn is the only White House official, current or former, who was convicted in connection with the Russia investigation. The president linked the timing of the pardon to the Thanksgiving holiday in his announcement, and the Flynn family responded with a statement expressing gratitude and solidarity to the president. Brandishing presidential power and political loyalty. A full pardon granted to former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn. Rolled out on Twitter, but long foreshadowed by President Trump. Uh, he was an innocent man. He is a uh, great gentleman. He was targeted by the Obama administration. And he was targeted in order to try and take down a president. Reaction from Democrats was swift and damning. It is a body blow to our national security. It's also a body blow to the rule of law. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi called the Flynn pardon an act of grave corruption and a brazen abuse of power. Flynn had pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI about his communication with the Russian ambassador and was fired by President Trump when he lied about it to the vice president. Flynn later asked to withdraw his plea. Trump ally Lindsey Graham called this a very good use of the pardon power. Wednesday, other Trump supporters gathered in Pennsylvania to outline complaints about election procedures before Republican state legislators, though Biden's win there is already certified. President Trump called in, denying his defeat. This election was rigged and we can't let that happen. We won Pennsylvania by a lot and we won all of these swing states by a lot. And 
We have to turn the election over. In Wilmington, a very different message from President-elect Joe Biden. We have full and fair and free elections. And then we honor the results. Biden also urged patience and unity against COVID. I know the country has grown weary of the fight. We need to remember we're at war with the virus, not with one another, not with each other. In another development, even after the Pennsylvania results were certified by the Democratic governor, Wednesday, a Pennsylvania appeals court judge ordered no further certification, no additional steps toward the Electoral College, after a GOP lawmaker filed suit challenging two and a half million mail-in ballots. That prompted another volley of court action, and the next steps are still to be determined. Chanel? All right, Kelly O'Donnell. Thank you, Kelly. Oh, let us go back to Mr. Roker on that parade share of Thanksgiving uh, Day games. What makes it so special? Well, Michelle, I think when you think about Thanksgiving, I always go back to, for me, uh, football was a big part of it. And, you know, I remember the only time I actually was able to coach on one was back in 1998 on CBS up in Detroit. Uh, it was a game I really didn't uh, enjoy very much. and kind of ruined my Thanksgiving because we lost in overtime on a coin flip uh, uh, discrepancy, I'd say controversy to say the least. But, you know, when you think about Thanksgiving, you think about football, you think about family, and uh, and you think about food, right? And so I always remember when I was a kid growing up in Pittsburgh, the fact that you know, we always would eat after the first game, we'd have dessert after the four o'clock game, and then uh, everyone was usually asleep by seven. Yeah, but how does the, the pan... Hey. You give me so much dough on insurance with that Parker Pro... All your mice got... It's always going to be political. It's always going to have that cross-section. You know, he said to me, you know, you look familiar, I think. Diploma, 20 years later, I retired as a Master Chief, and now I'm finishing up my PhD. So for me, life has always been um, difficult, and this race was no different. Now, we took it, we took it, uh, we took the fight to, uh, to the areas that traditional Republicans hadn't gone to. Our push cards were in English and Spanish from the very beginning, and I put 70,000 miles on my pickup truck. Well, that's, that's what it takes. But tell me, why, why are you a Republican? Like, why, what attracted you to the Republican side of the aisle, and why did you ultimately decide to run? Yeah, it's pretty simple for me. Uh, faith and family are everything. You know, I'm Catholic. That plays a big role in my life. I have six children, so uh, you know, being a father is 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 the most important job I will ever have. And then, you know, I believe in national defense. I believe in free enterprise, limited government, and I would argue most Hispanics do, specifically Mexican Americans. But the messenger matters, and I think it's important for the Republican Party to have uh, you know members of Congress that can go to these communities and really be able to relate with them. Well, that's what it's going to take. You get somebody who works hard, works smart, has served their country, and has a, a grounding philosophy such as yours. Uh, more power to you. God bless you. Thank you for your service to this country and our military, and congratulations in serving in the United States Congress. Congressman-elect Tony Gonzalez. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. All right, have a happy Thanksgiving. All right, still ahead, Los Angeles standing by its ban on in-person dining, despite there being little scientific proof linking it to the spikes in COVID cases. Hear from a restaurant manager who warns the temporary lockdown could devastate the industry. ever Christmas movie event. Cozy up with Fox Nation for a story about the importance of family. There will be other jobs. You're the only dad I have. About faith. Not only am I going to compete, I'm going to win. And finding love in unexpected places. With some of your favorite Fox faces joining along the way. This is the best Christmas I could have ever dreamed of. Christmas in the Rockies. A brand new original movie. Streaming now on Fox Nation. Save 35% when you use code 35OFF. Do you have any idea how your mattress affects your body and how well you sleep? 
Is it too hard or too soft, causing you to wake up with sore shoulders, back, or hips? Are you uncomfortable because you're too hot or too cold? Now you can get the total body support you need and the better sleep you want with the new MyPillow of law uh, and I'd like to think that there are at least a, a majority of senators who believe this was the wrong thing to do and no future president Demo Democrat or Republican should be allowed to do something like this and speaking of president-elect Biden he is set to get his first daily presidential briefing on Monday finally something that can happen only now after the General Services Administration formally recognized the transition and I know you were threatening to subpoena the head of the GSA to get this done are you confident that the Biden team can catch up on those briefings and be ready on day one I think the real damage there was to the transition process and I think that's a big concern again something we'll have to this transition can't be discretionary. There has to be certain benchmarks that say, if this happens, the transition process moves forward. Uh, so look, and I, I put the blame here squarely on the president, not the administrator or anybody else. Uh, he has created this problem, and again, one we have to correct. I do think that they can overcome this. They have the time necessary. Um, I was a member of the House Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, when we're in session, I'll get briefed two or three times a week and see how vital it is and clearly important to the president of the United States to keep us safe. <laughs> if I was the president, I'd want to get briefed two or three times a day. In contrast to President-elect Trump four years ago saying he didn't think he needed these and he began his degradation of the, in the intelligence community at that point. Okay, I want to try to squeeze in two more questions with you that are both very important. Uh, Biden announced his national security team this week. We'll pull up some of those names for you. Some familiar faces from the Obama administration. What's your take on, on these names uh, that they bring to the table and kind of this shift away from the current administration? Look, uh, they can hit the ground running. The times clearly demand experience. Uh, and, and boy, do we need them to get ready to go on day one. Uh, the, the threats that we've, we've experienced for so long, uh, China, Russia, North Korea, Syria, Iran, uh, they're all still there, the threat of ISIS and its resurgence, uh, the cyber attacks, and if anyone thinks the terrorism threat doesn't exist anymore, they're sadly mistaken. So it's a great team that knows how to get the job done and work well with Congress. All right, finally, uh, Congressman, we have skyrocketing number of cases for coronavirus, yet not uh, another relief bill in sight. And the Labor Department says nearly 14 million Americans are getting unemployment benefits that will expire um, at the after Christmas day. So as a member of Congress, what do you say to people who are relying on this lifeline? Well, I agree, it has to get done immediately. The fact of the matter is uh, the House, Democratic controlled House passed a measure what, seven, eight months ago, passed a compromise measure just a couple months ago. We're willing to negotiate and get something done. Clearly, I'd like to get something done to get us into the new administration. My advice to the Biden administration would be, let's get something done that lasts for the entire year to give people certainty, to understand that they'll have food to eat and a roof above their head. Small businesses will be taken care of and, of course, help for uh, local governments who are facing such extraordinary tax shortfalls. Yeah, you mentioned the food that families are going to be uh, not having this Thanksgiving. It's, it's sadly ironic. The food banks out there in this country are uh, the worst they've ever been in terms of stock and in terms of lines, uh, miles long. Um, what, you've mentioned kind of what you think needs to get done. What's the deal, the, what's the compromise here to make it happen? Uh, I think the normal process is, as we all know from civics lessons, is the House passes a bill, the Senate passes there, we go to conference and we reach a compromise. What's that a reasonable number? Well, look, at this point in time, I would be happy to get something done that takes us into February or March. Uh, and, and then we have to think big. Uh, and we did that. And we showed that we can act on a bipartisan, bicameral basis when this first began, when the quarantine began with COVID. You know, last March. Why, obviously, we can do it again. We must. We, we must remember those who are without on this Thanksgiving when we have so much to be uh, thankful for ourselves. Aptly named words, but we can and we must from Congressman Mike Quigley this morning. Congressman, thank you. Thank you. All right, something else that's quintessential fall watching football on Thanksgiving. It's a very, very big tradition. 
Uh, details on the last minute change, though, due to COVID-19 that will impact your NFL viewing plans. And growing concerns over whether AstraZeneca's coronavirus vaccine will be approved in the U.S. after the company admitted to mistakes in the vaccine trial. We'll talk with our medical expert about the impacts next. Five titans redefined the American dream and changed the world we live in forever. Empires of New York. We made USAA insurance. Rainfall outlook. We'll just have to watch the numbers. And they continue to warm through the first half of the weekend. 52 on Saturday, then we cool to 42 on Sunday. 36 Monday. Aberdeen and northeastern South Dakota, temperatures in the 40s to lower 50s through Saturday. Then we cool to 39 Sunday. We'll stay in the middle 30s to the lower 40s for next week. And a forecast into central South Dakota showing numbers near 60 on Saturday. Then we fall to 39 on Sunday. We'll stay in the 30s and 40s for much of next week with the dry skies. Teens and 20s for overnight lows. And western South Dakota will jump to 62 for a high on Saturday with sunshine. Then we fall 20 degrees for a high of 42 on Sunday. 40s and 50s will continue as we go into next week. Have a great Thanksgiving. Back scheme using medical devices in his surgeries. As Fora has denied the allegations and has filed a countersuit against Sanford. Well, Aaron, happy Thanksgiving to you. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well, Thor, and to all of you out there. We're starting off a little on the cool side here for our Thanksgiving with temperatures right now in the uh, teens for some of us. But You're not doing it. Your roles are going to be terrible. ...who take politics seriously, hosts of the podcast Politically Reactive, W. Kamau Bell, uh, political comedian and host and executive producer of CNN's United Shades of America and Hari Kondabalu, a comedian, writer, and podcast. Great to see you guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Let's start with the Georgia runoffs, since those are coming up. Kamau, um, why are those so critical? You know, as much as it's great that the Democrats won the presidency, you know, without those two Senate seats in Georgia, a lot of the big work that the activists who put the Democrat, Democrats in position to win the presidency they won't be able to get that stuff done. And uh, you were talking about things like big dream things like Medicare for all and ending the school to prison pipeline and, and expanding the courts. So I think that those two elections have the attention of every Democrat and progressive in the country right now. And Hari, what do you think is going to happen there? Oh man, if I knew that, I wouldn't just be a comedian right now. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I hope that there's, you know, again, record mobilization and, and the fact that it, it's a separate election and not part of the larger presidential election hopefully means that you have a, uh, people that are coming out because they want change and not solely because they're voting for a presidential election and they're going along the, the ballot. Hopefully you get people that want to see change, at, you know, vote, voting for the Dems in this if we're going to create change in this country. How do you guys... Uh, interpret what we saw with the black vote this year. So um, there was um, turnout, big turnout, obviously. Um, but if you look at, at back at the previous election, Donald Trump also increased his share of the black vote. So in 2016, 8% went to him. This year, 12%. I mean, this is according to exit polls. Okay, Kamal, so how do you interpret what was happening there? Well, as the uh, Black Whisperer, uh, in head Black Whisperer at CNN, <laughs> I would say that it's the same thing that I've said in the show since the, probably the first season, is black is not a monolith. Black people are not a monolith. Sometimes that's great, and sometimes that's frustrating. So yeah, I think that it's great to see everybody politically motivated. I think the thing that we know for sure is that if there wasn't so much voter suppression in this country, then Joe Biden's margin of victory would have been bigger, and more black people would have voted for him. All right, how do you see it? Oh, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> I think that, and who knows, maybe, maybe some of the votes that they suppressed, uh, you know, the last election were Trump votes. Like, who knows whose votes they're suppressing at this point. So maybe that explains the 4% the jump. I mean, th this election is really about protecting democracy. It's about actually, like, because, you know, if, if they lose this election, you're going to have to deal with Mitch McConnell for another four years, obstructing any conversation or any potential compromise. Like, they're stuck, and, and they've, they're already setting up the stage for the Democrats to fail. So 
this election really kind of determines in some ways the next four years. And, you know, Kamal, just tell us a little bit more about what you're talking about, about voter suppression, because I'm not sure that everybody is aware of the instances that you all see. I mean, we're talking about things about, like, you know, we're talking about in Travis County in uh, Texas, where there's only one, there's only one uh, place to vote, to vote in advance for a place that has millions of people. We're talking about the number of polling places in, in different urban areas where people have to wait in line for hours and hours because there's simply not enough polling places. So we're talking about things that naturally suppress the vote. And then we're talking about systemic things, like if you have to, if you have, to have an ID to vote, which in many places you don't. Out here in California, they trust me that I am who I say I am. But in many places, you have to have an ID. And not everybody has access to an ID because IDs cost money. And so I think there are places where you can vote with your gun license, but you can't vote with your college ID. So there's ways in which the system is naturally suppressing votes, and that often affects black people and communities of color at a higher rate. All right, what effect do you think Black Lives Matter and the protests that we saw over the summer had on this election? I mean, there's a lot of talk of, about how that potentially led to more voters coming out to vote for Donald Trump because you know, they were upset about the calls for police reform. And, and you know, there are some surveys that show that, like, people, that was one of the big issues. People came out because of police reform and the discussions about police reform, abolishing the police. But the thing is that, like, who is to say that that percentage of people who felt that was a big issue weren't people of color and other people who felt like the police have to change? You know, like, there's a lot of assumption that it hurt the Democrats. I don't think there's really any proof that it hurt the Democrats. In fact, I think it led to more people coming out, being passionate and wanting change, and finally, like, doing something about it. But, Kamau, do you think it's possible that President Trump was able to exploit those protests for his own purposes by making it seem as though all protests were violent and destructive? I mean, he talked about that a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think he exploited it to every ability that he had to exploit it to. And what it showed is that that's not actually a winning strategy. The winning strategy is one of inclusion, one of which people feel protected by the police. And the Democrats absolutely, and by the Democrats I mean Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, absolutely have to know that Black Lives Matter was the engine of the activism that got them to win places like Georgia and Pennsylvania. That the, 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 the engine of that was community activism, leadership that was funneled and fueled by Black Lives Matter. Gentlemen, great to get your take on all of this. Uh, Kamal Bell, Ari Kondabalu, we really appreciate it. And again, the podcast is politically reactive. Great to talk to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. you. Nursing home. With positive samples so we can better understand did person A pass it to person B, or is this coming in from outside in the community? So we we're postponing this, this Thursday game until Sunday afternoon, as I understand it. Why are you so confident that you're going to be able to play the game just three days later if you, if you can't play it today? Well, let me start out by saying we take every single day one step at a time. We have to look at the results every day and make the best decision for that day. But in this particular situation, we feel like we have a good understanding where transmission occurred. We also feel like we have a good understanding of where that window of transmission may close. And we certainly don't want to put anyone on the field for either team if we think they're still in that window of vulnerability. But at present, with the information we have in hand, we feel fairly confident that we understand the end of this transmission chain and we'll be able to get the game played safely on Sunday. We did not have that confidence that we could do that today, and that's why we made the decision to postpone the game. Got it. You know, we've all walked into a gas station or a store to buy a lottery ticket, hoping we have the winning ticket, only to walk out empty-handed. Well, now this one group on a very lucky streak has walked out not with one winning ticket, but with many winning tickets. This morning, growing questions about a lottery mystery. At least four Princeton graduates hitting the jackpot big time, finding 66 winning tickets in multiple states with jackpots totaling more than $6 million. According to an investigation by the Indianapolis Star, one of them, 27-year-old Manuel Montori, has been on an 18-month winning streak, cashing in 61 winning scratch-offs in just one day in September. His name, Wallpaper, on this winner's page. The paper reporting that Montori was a philosophy major and while attending Princeton, he landed a job at an investment company that manages the school's endowment. 
They're either the luckiest people in the world or they found a way to beat the system. The winning strategy appears to include buying in bulk. In Indiana alone, the group reportedly bought from four dozen different gas stations, liquor stores, and convenience shops, including this smoking lotto in Bloomington, where they would buy entire books of tickets. She would text me and she would ask me how many books I had, and I would let her know how many books, and then she would come in and she would just purchase all of them. The manager says she was told they were working for a man conducting a study and that the results would be shared later on YouTube. If it's a study, there's plenty of data. At that store alone, it's estimated that they bought about 1,600 tickets at $30 each. That's a total cost of $48,000. And that's just one store. If they did that at four dozen other Indiana locations, they would have spent more than $2 million, which begs the question, are they actually profiting? Even under the best of circumstances, the amount that they're making uh, net of what they're spending on the tickets uh, is, is not going to be very, very large. And there's another possible layer to the winnings. The Indianapolis Star also reporting that all four individuals are associated with a company called Black Swan Capital LLC, a company Montori founded. They have established a corporation and in gambling losses, you can be written off of your taxes. So they might be able to write those losing tickets off as an expense of doing business with the gambling to, again, get some tax benefits on their winnings. And we should point out is not some woke fad for them. It is central uh, to their uh, religion because our Ten Commandments say thou shalt not kill. It's also, by the way, Griff, central to our Constitution where we say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And there's a reason why life is first because if you don't have life, um, liberty and the pursuit of happiness is pretty much a mute point. So. Um, I don't think the Democrats are learning anything from what happened with Hispanics um, over this last election, and and Barack Obama's proof he's just he's just so disappointed in Hispanics and Christians. But, but one other thing too, Griff. I mean, if you look at the president and the Democrat Party, they're promoting socialism, and a lot of Hispanics yeah. who come from socialist countries and they, and they see the devastation of socialism are like, I, I don't want what Democrats are offering. I want freedom. I want opportunity. I want to make a good wage, and I had that under President Trump. So, I mean, Hispanics are Americans. Um, and care about everything that you care about and I care about. And uh, again, we want to take care of our families and, and make a little more money in our paycheck. And that's what President Trump offered. And, and Democrats completely missed. Yeah. They just want to throw around the racist term and think that that's going to that's mm -hmm. woo us over. And I think Hispanics are a lot smarter than that. Especially in this house. <laughs> <laughs> and we want to get your thoughts as well on a second topic. So overnight, the Supreme Court blocked Governor Cuomo's capacity caps on houses of worship, with Justice Barrett playing a key role in the ruling. Sean, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I and mean, so we're celebrating uh, Thanksgiving today, and we look back to our pilgrims. They didn't come here for gold. They didn't come here for... Um, you know, the fountain of youth, they came here for religious freedom, right? This is why they came to America. And that's what brought us Thanksgiving and brought us our great country. So God bless the Supreme Court today saying, listen, Andrew Cuomo is overstepping his bounds, that he's going to put limits on churches in, in the hot zones or red zones of no more than 10 people. And that's the also synagogues and mosques. Uh, all places of worship are going to be able to open back up. Uh, thank God for that. And what, what's shocking, though, is how close the court was, because John Roberts, uh, who, is, uh, who is appointed and or nominated by George Bush, sided with the liberals like he did in Obamacare. Thank God we had Amy Coney Barrett on the court uh, with, with Gorsuch and others. And they said, listen, it's, 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 how, how do you say that you can go to a bike shop or you can go buy a six pack of beer and not have these kind of restrictions, but you're going to put restrictions on our houses of worship? This doesn't make any sense. And as Rachel just said, religious liberty and freedom are protected in the First Amendment. Um, there was no bike shops or liquor stores or pot dispensaries. Or strip clubs. That's, also, exactly. that's also allowed. That's not protected in the First Amendment. But religious liberty is. And so though we might have Democrat governors who don't really care about uh, uh, about places of worship. At least we have a Supreme Court who still wants to protect our right to worship. And, and, I'll, and I'll just add to that that, you know, going to church, worshiping God for Christians, for Jews, for Muslims, it is essential. It's essential to who we are. And I think, again, for a lot of liberal secular um, governors um, and ex-presidents, they think this is just a hobby for us. It's not. It's
central to who we are. And thank God that the Supreme Court on such a, a great day, right before Thanksgiving, which is a religious his, uh, religious freedom uh, uh, celebration in our country, truly, if we look at the history of it, um, good on them. Congratulations to Donald Trump. We're thankful for you for putting Amy Comey Barrett on the court because she was decisive in this decision. She was. Hey, yeah, it's Sean and I had the honor and privilege of serving with you in the United States Congress. And Rachel, you got one of the most beautiful families out there. I know some governors want to limit the size of House Behold's uh, meeting for Thanksgiving at 10, but you've got nine kids and there's two of you, and I can do that math. Uh, you've got one of the most beautiful families. Tell, share with us. Share with us your things. We have them with us. We have them with us. So we're, we're breaking COVID guest limit rules just by being us. Right. Um, and then yes. you're, uh, here we go. I'm going to show you the little baby. She hasn't had her Fox hey, debut yet, but here she is. <laughs> and um, we also break another rule, Jason. We dress these kids up. They, they, they dress themselves up as pilgrims and Indians at dinner, which I know isn't very PC. I guess it's cultural appropriation. but. We do that here. Right. <laughs> we still celebrate uh, our pilgrims and that first uh, Thanksgiving dinner. But listen, this is our family. T today we're going um, to, for the first time, we're going to deep fry turkey. We usually uh, no. cook our uh, turkey in the oven, but we're going to try deep frying. I uh, learned that on Fox and Friends, by the way. You guys brought in the guy from the, 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 the guy who does the turkey frying. And yes. um, I learned it there, and we decided to do it this yeah, year. Yeah, we hope we don't burn our house down. <laughs> Nice. John McLemore. It was Chef John McLemore, and that is awesome. I remember I was there. Good luck today. Now, You're with me, Griff. <laughs> yes, you remember. Uh, now, they did tell us it is a, could be a fire hazard, so just be very careful when you put the frozen turkey in there. You don't want to cause any fires. Be very safe. So I read Griff, so I'll have a fire extinguisher nearby, and hopefully I, the fire department doesn't we've, have to come and We've got him in charge of that part. <laughs> if it doesn't go so well, I'll send you the Boehner brine recipe I talked about earlier. Former speaker. Hey, John, I've got John. one, too. Oh, Don't leave it. me out of it. There's a ton of recipes for you guys. Yeah, well, you got it. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Well, we ejected our turkey last night, you guys, so I hope you'll taste well. But yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you guys as well from the Duffy family. You guys have a great one. Enjoy turkey. All right. Thanks very much. See you guys. Have a safe one. Right, Bye, everybody. Guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye. All right. Now let's check in with Jillian and get some headlines. Hey, Jillian. Good morning. It's easier if you don't cook and you provide the wine. So if anyone would like to follow my lead. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Let's start off with this. Disney is laying off more employees because of the pandemic. A company filing shows it's laying off 32,000 workers. That's 4,000 more than previously thought. The majority of layoffs will be at Disney parks and are expected to start next year. Disneyland has been closed since March in compliance with California's restrictions. Black Lives Matter protesters gather outside the Los Angeles mayor's home. They demanded Eric Garcetti not be picked for any position in Joe Biden's cabinet. As speculation swirls, he's being considered for roles including HUD's secretary. The protesters calling Garcetti completely unqualified, saying he has failed to house homeless people in Los Angeles. House Majority Whip James Clyburn also speaking out about Biden's cabinet, saying he's falling short of naming black figures to top posts. Clyburn telling The Hill in part, quote, from all I hear, black people have been given fair consideration, but there is only one black woman so far. I want to see where the process leads to, what it produces, but so far, it's not good. President Trump, President-elect Joe Biden, and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris are among the list of nominees for Times Person of the Year. Dr. Anthony Fauci, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, and Stacey Abrams also being considered for the title. The distinction goes to the person or group deemed to have the greatest influence on the events of the year for better or worse. The person of the year will be named on December 10th. Be interesting to see who it is. Guys, I nominate all three of you. <laughs> Thank you for that. I was just going to say, I'm not like a gambling person, but I do have a strong prediction with that. And I was like, I don't even know how mm. to bet. I don't, if I wanted to bet, I don't even know what I would do with that. But um, yeah, it will be interesting to see, uh, especially given. So last year it was Greta and Greta Thunberg. Yeah. We'll see who makes the cover. Yeah. Very good. Right. Very good. All right. We got some weather that's affecting people across the country. Adam, what's the latest? Yeah, well, guys, if you notice here along the East Coast, a little bit of rain, uh, at times fairly heavy rain, but by and large,
going to turn off to be a really nice day. Even if you're dealing with some of that rain now, it might be clearing off. Here's what our temperatures look like out there early this morning. The warmer air right along the coast, that's a warm front. Anytime you get one of those frontal boundaries, that's typically when you see a little bit of activity. And, you know, the holidays are a time when many of us feel overburdened a little bit by expectations. We think the day needs to be perfect. And let's face it, this Thanksgiving is not going to be normal for many families. So one tip is to really reframe the way that you think about today and let go of some of the I have to's and I musts and I shoulds uh, that so often weigh us down. Uh, free yourselves from those to take a little bit of the pressure off in the day and, and that will allow us to enjoy the day uh, a little bit more. When people are feeling lonely and, and so many families are gonna have that empty chair uh, at the table today, uh, counting your blessings is another good thing to do to, to take some of the pressure off and to, and to just make ourselves feel better. Uh, spend some time as you're thinking about those you're missing and loving um, counting your blessings and, and thinking about what's going well in your life. What do you have gratitude for on this Thanksgiving day? And if the opportunity allows, it's uh, useful to help other people. Uh, many families have a ritual of uh, working out a food kitchen uh, or something like that uh, on a holiday such as today. I also like the idea of just doing something indulgent, something that feels uh, a little bit extra that you might not do on a normal day. That could be curling up with a good book or re-watching a favorite movie. Some people love a nice bubble bath or a really favorite dessert. That certainly can include some time on Zoom. And I know we've all had perhaps way too much of that lately, but, uh, but Zooming with family today, anything that just makes the day feel special uh, can sort of distract our attention from the fact that we're not around our loved ones. And then finally, uh, I think it's really worth acknowledging that even though this year's holiday uh, is, is not gonna be normal, that doesn't mean that it won't ever be normal again. So uh, one of my favorite tips is just to spend some time with those you're talking to either in person or over Zoom, thinking about and planning ahead for next year. Yeah. What might we do next year? Um, so we have something to look forward to so we can look forward and ahead rather than being uh, focused only on what we're missing today. And I think they call that for, for our third point there, do something indulgent. I think they call that treat yourself. Corey Floyd with Indeed. us this, yes. this Thanksgiving. Thank you so much, Corey. Happy Thanksgiving to you. I really appreciate Happy the backdrop. We need a little bit of that sunshine and the weather is supposed to be really nice for the holiday. So get outside. In a time where we've grown accustomed to air hugs, you know, obviously, they're having to shut down parts of that. But when I was talking to a few homeless gentlemen in the back, they said they would not have holidays without an organization like this. And they were surprised by all the families that are in cars that obviously some of them didn't want to be on TV waiting to come and eat food as well. A tough holiday period, but thankful to see organizations like this. Absolutely, and, and the many people who volunteer their time to make sure that it can happen, even if it has to be a little different this year. Ryan, thank you. Uh, an estimated 50 million Americans are facing food insecurity this holiday season. That's according to Feeding America. Congress, of course, has gone home for the holiday, leaving so many of those families struggling to make ends meet this Thanksgiving and beyond. Joining us now is award-winning chef and restaurateur Tom Colicchio. Uh, great to have you back with us this morning. Look, you've been sounding this alarm now for months uh, about the need, about the need for Congress to put aside their politics and focus on the people. That's not happening right now. Can you just put in perspective for us where we stand? The restaurant industry has been decimated, especially smaller restaurants. Uh, what are they facing right now? Well, obviously, the closing of restaurants, and so many are closing across the country, is definitely adding to unemployment, which is de definitely adding to hunger. Um, you know, when we're looking at these numbers, 50 million Americans uh, are food insecure. We're talking about another 42, 24 million Americans who say they didn't get enough to eat during the course of the week. One in four children are going to bed hungry. Seniors who are choosing between medication and, and, and food. If we saw this on the news, if I was watching this on, on CNN, I would think I was looking at a third world country. Yet this is America, and we've chosen to do nothing about this right now. And it's great that you're, you're, you're uh, depicting stories of people who are helping right now, and people want to help around the holiday season, but the people that are helping, they're going to be hungry tomorrow, and the next day, and the next day. And it's not going to be a Thanksgiving. 
And so we need massive government help right now. Um, the HEROES Act includes a 15% increase in the SNAP uh, benefit program, but I think we need to get beyond that. And we need to actually start talking about ending hunger in this country because it's something that we can do. We're choosing not to. I mean, Tom, you're talking about the ripple effect, obviously, of restaurants closing because then there's a whole supply chain um, domino effect that it has. So it's not just that, oh, we don't get to go out to a wonderful Saturday night that we like that's relaxing and have a wonderful experience. It's, it's devastating, as we're just seeing, for all of the people along those rungs. Sure, sure. So, we're having two conversations here, which is, um, you know, there's there's hunger that there's been systemic hunger in this country for a long time, um, but then there's the increased amount of hunger because of, of COVID. Uh, hunger Free America just put out a devastating report uh, that released it yesterday. Um, you can go to hungerfreeamerica.org to read that. Um, it just depicts skyrocketing uh, instances of hunger right now. Uh, on the restaurant side of things, yes, when we're talking about uh, independent restaurants. Uh, we employ about 11 million people, but once you factor in farmers and fishermen and cheesemakers, and also let's drill down a little bit, plumbers, electricians, all those service industries that help service the restaurant. Um, if restaurants uh, disappear at the rate of 65 to 85%, and those are the estimates, without government help, 65 to 80% of all independent restaurants will close, that entire ecosystem comes down too. So this is why I think it, it, at, at, at the Independent Restaurant Coalition, we're focused so much on just giving the restaurants a lifeline to keep open so we get through this pandemic. So when the economy starts to come back and people start feeling safe to go out to eat, uh, restaurants will be there to employ everyone that we had to lay off. And so uh, it's, a, it's a tough position that, that, we're, that the entire country is in right now uh, because of the, the inability to get our arms around this pandemic and, 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 and have a plan to, 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 to take care of it. Hopefully that's going to change soon. Yeah, there's no plan, and it's, and it's been politicized right. from day one, yeah. which is a major issue. When you talk about these restaurants that are hanging on by a thread, and we look at what's happening in Los Angeles County, for example, outdoor dining close as well as indoor dining. Um, you know, how long do you think a lot of these smaller restaurants can survive on simply takeout or delivery only now that we're at the end of November? They, they really can. In, in L.A. County closed indoor, outdoor. Uh, Minneapolis, uh, they close they closed indoor. They may as well have outdoor closed because it's too, it's too cold. New York City, um, I would imagine, you know, very shortly it's going to get shut down as well. Um, we're seeing shutdowns across the country. And a lot of restaurateurs are angry, but they're angry really because they're, they're, they're feeling helpless. We've done everything. We've pivoted to takeout. We've done grocery boxes. We've done, you know, set up, set up our restaurants as grocery stores. We've tried everything. It's really not going to work. Uh, these are all band-aids. These are all just desperate. You know, we're desperate trying to fix a, a problem that we really can't. Um, and so we we need help. The Restaurants Act. Uh, it is part of the Heroes Act now. Um, it has bipartisan support. We have 48 co-sponsors in the Senate. We have 203 co-sponsors in the House. Uh, bipartisan support. If this were put on the floor as a standalone bill, not part of the Heroes Act, it would yeah. easily pass. Mm -hmm. And it provides the lifeline that restaurants need. And Tom, very quickly, um, how can people help today for, I mean, not only just restaurants, hunger? Yeah, on, on hunger, listen, we have to start, see, I, this is where I have some hope. When I see these long lines, these three-hour lines, and, and the last the segment, you, you're, or the, the last person who was talking, they mentioned that um, uh, some people were ashamed to actually be on camera. Well, that's because we demonize the poor. Uh, we've, we've made it, it's your problem, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps and maybe you made some mistakes and so we, we demonize poor people. Well, people aren't born to poverty, you know, they don't ask to be born to poverty. But what I hope now, I hope there's a, a deeper empathy because when I see these long lines of three hours and four hours of people who are in their cars waiting, these were people who were solidly middle class, who had good paying jobs eight months ago, they lost them. And so, so now I, I, I hope that, that, you know, there before the grace of God go I, I hope, I hope that resonates and people realize that it, it, something very small can actually put you in a really difficult position. Yeah. And so when we go to fund SNAP and we try to create programs that will benefit society and benefit yeah. people, especially people who are struggling, that more people will say, I I'm on for this, I sign up for that and support those members of Congress that, that are trying to get that done. And we know that our viewers are really generous and do open their pockets and do that. Tom Flavio, thank you very much. Great to talk to you. Happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Erica, great to see you. Thanks for being here. CNN's coverage continues after this break. Our Monday afternoon, the victim was taken to a house, Sioux Falls Hospital, where he is currently recovering. Norman is being held on a $50,000 bond.
An Elkton man has been identified following a deadly crash near Aurora. The Department of Public Safety says Raymond Campos died Saturday from injuries he received in a crash Friday night. The car hit a deer, causing the deer to collide with the windshield of the truck driven by Campos. Campos was airlifted to Sioux Falls, where he later died. The four passengers in Campos' truck and the driver of the car were not injured. A Sioux Falls man is behind bars after allegedly starting a fire outside of an apartment building. Eric Vasquez faces several charges, including aggravated assault following an incident early this morning. Police say Vasquez visited his ex-girlfriend yesterday and things were reportedly fine. He later returned upset. Officers say Vasquez broke her laptop, threatened to burn her home down, and kept her in her room against her will. The victim went to sleep and woke up to an odor. She saw a fire outside along with Vasquez. Aaron, over to you. Happy day. Happy Thanksgiving to you as well, Thor. Temperature-wise, it is a little cool here to start off our in So we're already starting off a little warmer than average here for this time of year. Uh, wind is not going to be an issue either. Only about 5 to 15 here this morning. That's uh, Wind-wise, we're going to see the wind sit at about 5 to 15 as well. We're going to be stuck in the upper 30s for some up to the north, but most east to the lower 40s for next week. And a forecast into central South Dakota showing numbers near 6 40s later on today. We'll drop back down to the 42 for a high, 52 degrees on Saturday, even more. And western South Dakota will jump to 62 for a high on Saturday. On Monday, does look like that cold front is going to be moving through. Your designer, so when she needs to make a home like the rock next week, have a great Thanksgiving. It's back. The Push Pull Drag Sale going on now at Autoland. Drag it. Just get it to Autoland and receive at least 50. Slash. East from yes time for today. And temperatures will probably hit the 40s in many locations. We'll go with dry conditions. I don't want to have too much of the first course, right? Because you got to make sure there's room for the second. But we, we have had a lot of rainfall. This actually is some good news for the drought. You think about, you know, gratitude. You're probably grateful for this rain here, certainly if you are. Your daytime favorites return to their regular schedule Monday. Happy Thanksgiving. I can't wait. That's the scary. Want another reason to feel good? ready to welcome in the holiday season with a very special celebration. This year, CBS is proud to bring you what you have come to expect every Thanksgiving morning. Classic moments and highlights from the world-famous Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. To carry on the tradition, we'll be enjoying our all-time favorite floats, balloons, and marching bands. That plus show-stopping numbers from Tony Award-winning musicals Come From Away and Dear Evan Hansen. And musical performances by Mickey Guyton and Maddie and Tay. And throughout the morning, celebrity guests will be taking a moment to share their holiday with us. All of this leading up to a visit from Santa Claus himself. And now, please welcome your hosts from the set of Entertainment Tonight, Kilty Knight and Kevin Frazier. Happy holidays, everyone, and welcome to our very special CBS Thanksgiving Day celebration. Let's be honest, for so many people around the country, waking up and watching the Thanksgiving Day Parade is like the ultimate mm -hmm. start to the entire season, whether you're at home or if you're in person at the parade in New York. And usually we are in our anchor booth in New York among a crowd of 1.5 million parade goers. Feeling the vibe, the yeah, energy, the excitement, so and the cold. But this morning... We have a very different way of kicking off the holiday season because we won't let the pandemic beat us. No, we will not. We are reimagining our traditional Thanksgiving morning. Think of it as one big party. Here's the deal. We'll be bringing you the best of the best floats and balloons and bands from last year's parade. And we've also got brand new exclusive performances from some of the biggest superstars in music. Get ready. It may be different this year, y'all, but it's going to be a very special time to welcome in the holiday season. And it has to be because someone Ooh. is coming from the North Pole and is going to be arriving in high style and no one wants to miss that. Let's get the big man. I think I knew who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Traditionally on Thanksgiving morning, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade gets ready to take off on the Upper West Side, specifically at West 77th Street and Central Park. 
taped and has been made for TV. Uh, and then also, the number of participants in the parade is down a whole bunch, almost 90% fewer people than we usually see inside this parade. And so what balloons you see moving around, it'll just be a short period of time. Spectators are not allowed. And as I said, the whole thing is basically a TV production. That's all in the, in, in the attempt to try to keep some traditions alive while also staying safe for the coronavirus. Poppy? I'm glad they're doing it in a safe way. I think it's going to bring a lot of joy to a lot of people watching this morning. Evan, what are you grateful for this Thanksgiving? I'm grateful for you, Poppy, and for being on uh, air with you <laughs> this morning out here in the rain. You're just buttering me up. Evan, happy Thanksgiving. I am grateful <laughs> for health and for my kids. We all have a lot uh, of blessings to count this morning for sure. Evan, thanks. Let's get to our, our colleague, Rosa Flores. She joins us in Miami. Good morning to you, Rosa. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, I wish we had better news to talk about, but the number of COVID-19 patients in Miami-Dade County that need ventilators has increased by 44% in just the last two weeks. You know, Poppy, you're absolutely right. And you and I have been talking about the situation here in Miami actually for a very long time now, it seems, since the summer surge. And medical experts warned us about this, about this fall surge, and now we're actually seeing it. But let's take a look at just the United States first, because the number of cases across the country is surging, with the U.S. reporting more than 181,000 cases yesterday. Hospitalizations are nearing 90,000, and the number of deaths per day is also increasing, with more than with more than 2,200 recorded just yesterday. Look, some states across the country are reacting to this. For example, they are rolling back some of their reopening plans. That's the case in Louisiana. Or they're tightening their mask rules. That's the case in North Carolina. Or they're adding curfews. That's the case in Bear County, Texas, the area of San Antonio. The point being that hospital systems across the state are getting tested. That's what we're hearing from officials in Rhode Island and also in Washington State and right here in Miami-Dade County where I am. As Poppy mentioned just moments ago, the number of hospitalizations are increasing in the past two weeks. Miami-Dade County has seen a 25% increase in the number of hospitalizations, a 43% increase in the number of ICUs, and a 44% increase in the number of ventilators. And Poppy, we've talked about this. Medical experts have warned us that this is going to happen, and there's a very simple solution. People have to wear masks, they have to social distance, and they have to exercise hygiene. And on this Thanksgiving, not gather in large groups. Absolutely, absolutely, Rosa. Thank you for that reporting there. It's just such a... Flynn, who had pleaded guilty to lying to investigators in the Russia probe. Flynn later asked to withdraw that plea and was waiting for a judge to act. The president cleared the slate and Democrats are calling it an abuse of power. Meanwhile, President-elect Joe Biden delivered his own Thanksgiving message and urged American families to come together safely and remain patient as the country deals with COVID. I know the country has grown weary of the fight. We need to remember we're at war with the virus, not with one another, not with each other. On this holiday, the Bidens will be at their Delaware Beach home, and the Trumps will spend their first and only Thanksgiving at the White House instead of at the Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. Chanel? All right, Kelly, thank you. Tributes are pouring in this morning for Argentinian soccer legend Diego Maradona. He died Wednesday at the age of 60. He suffered a fatal heart attack, fatal heart attack at his home in Buenos Aires. Maradona? widely considered one of the best who ever played a game of soccer. He became one of Argentina's greatest heroes, leading his country to its second World Cup back in 1986. Brazilian soccer icon Pele tweeting, I lost a great friend and the world lost a legend. One day, I hope we can play ball together in the sky. Mm. It's a view that is truly out of this world. NASA astronaut Victor Glover recently traveled to the International Space Station for the first time, sharing this unique perspective of Earth. The video just doesn't do it justice. It is pretty amazing, though. It's breathtaking, isn't it? Glover is part of the Crew-1 mission that launched aboard SpaceX's Crew Dragon capsule earlier this month. He'll call the International Space Station home for the next six months. All right, 807 here. 
Hoda Boost. Yeah, I was going to say, Hoda's got, uh, she's got parade duty. I want me to do it? Let's do some boosting, do yes. I'll, I'll try it, I'll try it. <laughs> so everyone craves a space of their own to, you know, relax, unwind. You might call it a man cave, a she shed. But what if you're too young for one of those? What's okay. this? Okay, so we're in our basement. He thinks nobody knows about his hiding spot. What are you doing in here, bud? What, what you have an iPad in it? What are you doing? Noah, what are you doing, buddy? Uh, He's like, I'm living my best life. That's what I'm doing. And you can Noah. leave me. He carved out that little little spot inside a kitchen cabinet in the basement. He's got his snacks there, his iPad, his blankie. That is so cute. He's like, can you close his, the door, please? Right, he just needs his privacy back. Look at him. Okay, I, I hear you. That's He's like, all right, Mom. Good to see you, Mom. Take like care, Mom. Goldfish or something? Oh, that's no. adorable. Happy Thanksgiving. That was a good one. All right, coming up, our Harry Smith checks in with the queen of Thanksgiving, Martha Stewart. Hi, Harry. Look at Harry and his final Happy love. Happy Thanksgiving. Got the fire show. going. They're going to look back at her four decades of turkey tips on the Today Show, and she'll share advice, her advice, for a pared-down holiday celebration that's right after these messages. He makes me smile. Shoot. Right was away from the walkie-talkie ear. Effectiveness, but they don't really explain. Bill Clinton pardoned his half-brother after serving a year in prison on cocaine distribution charges. And now Democrats are saying, and calling, Schiff in fact, calling him an organized crime criminal. Well, I'm not sure that you're going to ever find um, that hypocrisy is kind of the sole dominion of one political party or the other. Uh, again, this is really pro just problematic for the president because these pardons are so close to him around a very controversial uh, element of his presidency that is Russian involvement in the 2016 election. Uh, y you could argue that that presidents shouldn't do that, that anything sort of close to the president himself uh, should be uh, sort of off limits. Um, but as you point out, we've seen this happen in the past where cases do get close to the president, perhaps not in a criminal case, uh, but uh, from, from personal desire, personal standing, donors, etc. Right. You know, it's, it's, it goes without saying a lot of it is personal. Um, and, and many have, have said that Democrats have been after the president since before he was elected president. Uh, KT McFarland says that you know, Flynn's criminal case was never actually about him. It was always about getting Donald Trump. I want you to listen to this. It wasn't about General Flynn. It was always about getting Donald Trump. Senior officials in the Obama administration, in the West Wing, in the Justice Department, in the FBI, and in the intelligence community, they knew Mike Flynn didn't commit any crime in talking to the Russian ambassador. But how does the country get those three years back? So I think the issue here, first of all, General Flynn, obviously, he, he pled guilty and he admitted twice um, to lying to the FBI about Russia. And Russia was obviously the bone of contention for the, the Trump administration, if you will, uh, for over the last four years. I would say that was probably the biggest stick in his side. Um, so I think it's just a personal vendetta um, for many Democrats. But, but nonetheless, I mean, there, there is a, there's a two-sided two -sided story here. Yeah, well, KT McFarland was appointed by uh, General Flynn to be his deputy uh, at the National Security, on the National Security Council as deputy NSA. Um, and uh, uh, General Flynn pled guilty to lying to the FBI about his, his uh, discussions with the Russian ambassador. They have him on tape. He said that he never discussed sanctions with the ambassador. In fact, he did discuss sanctions with the ambassador. Right. Uh, Roger Stone was convicted of, of uh, lying, of uh, also witness tampering. So, you know, these are cases right. that went through the, ju the judicial system and the individuals were found to be right. guilty or, or admitted it. So I'm not sure that this is kind of a vendetta right. in that regard if, in fact, the individuals uh, were found to uh, have All right. uh, broken the law. I'm going to switch gears here now. I want to go to New York. Uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, as you know, tried to shut down uh, churches um, with more than 50 in attendance, and the Supreme Court has come back.
four to five ruling saying no, and it rejected that. Um, my question to you is, does Wednesday's Supreme Court ruling maybe usher in a potential of onslaught of appeals from other businesses and organizations who not only feel that they've been unjustly targeted over the restrictions due to COVID, uh, but maybe they are now going to be standing up. I mean, religion obviously is a different category, but do different businesses have the same right to appeal these COVID restrictions? Well, you might see that. This is really quite interesting. Uh, I mean, this, this stemmed from problems that New York was having with religious gatherings that exceeded not 10 or 15 or 20, but got into the hundreds and hundreds of people that were gathering. Orthodox communities in, in Brooklyn and Queens, the Catholic uh, Church also joined this, um, this case before the, the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court decided was that, look, you know, we're not health experts. We don't want to get into that realm. But we noticed that there aren't restrictions on other aspects of business. They mentioned acupuncture, they mentioned campgrounds. Yeah. And that this particular activity, uh, religious activity, is specifically protected in the Constitution. First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So the court came down and said, look, we're here to protect the Constitution. Sorry, you can't do this to religious organizations. All right. All right, John Bossy, thank you very much. Appreciate you talking to us this morning. Pleasure. Leland. His administration to be overwhelmed by Trump, Trump, Trump. And then, and then there are also ongoing investigations on the state level. I think that uh, President-elect Biden is, uh, in the clip that you just played, it's making a slightly different point that I agree with, which is, in that clip, what he's saying is that is not a decision, the decision whether to investigate or prosecute the former president uh, or, frankly, anyone else. That is not a decision that the White House should be making. It's a decision that the attorney general should be making to avoid what we've seen for the last four years, which is President Trump uh, using the Department of Justice as a weapon against his enemies and to absolve his friends, as we just you know, have seen with uh, Michael Flynn, where he got the Department of Justice to try to dismiss the case. And when that didn't work, he just went ahead and issued a pardon. So I, I totally agree with what you um, heard from President-elect, that that is admirable to leave that to the Attorney General. And I think for um, viewers, it's really important to understand the reason for that principle is, you know, all around the world, we see autocratic countries where there is no rule of law where um, presidents and prime ministers use their Justice Department to go after political enemies and have trumped up charges. So we don't want to turn into that. Um, but the second issue is really whether the attorney general should make that uh, decision of going forward with an investigation. And that's what I wrote about in uh, the New York Times. And I think that while there are certainly political reasons to look forward I think that there also are substantial reasons why an attorney general would want to uh, vindicate the rule of law and um, really have a uh, position that, you know, even the president of the United States, and frankly, especially the president of the United States, is not above the law. It's, it's a great uh, argument that you make. I, I recommend it to people. We literally only have 30 seconds left, but I have to ask you about Michael Flynn. He lied for people who say, so what? That's what government officials do. Uh, and by the way, his family issued a statement blaming vengeful individuals intent on destroying General Flint and our country. What do you say? You have to remember that Michael Flynn actually admitted um, under oath to a federal judge that he lied two times um, to the FBI. He lied to the vice president of the United States. And he did so while he was the national security advisor to the president of the United States. In addition, he committed the a crime, which was lobbying for a foreign country without disclosing it. Um, so he's got a, a host of criminality. Um, and for him now to be denying it um, is, is frankly the reason why it was so inappropriate to give him a pardon. Andrew Weissman, good to see you on this Thanksgiving Day. Thank you so much for spending a bit of your holiday with us. Coming up, sidelined, a big NFL matchup postponed due to a COVID outbreak.
in your pajamas. Yeah. Grab a little snack. Exactly. It's be a party. We'll be back with more of our Thanksgiving Day celebration. This is CBS. Okay, from our SEAL team family to yours. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that Geico's whole 15 minutes thing? You were quoted in this New York Times op-ed that discusses Americans' definition of freedom and, and how this country's response to this COVID pandemic has actually been quite similar to the gun violence pandemic. And that many feel these lifestyle restrictions have been a violation of their own freedoms. What do you think is missing? So what I think is missing here, Brooke, is an awareness of the larger community. This is not about infringing on freedom. This is about keeping yourself and your family and those around you healthy. Listen, my town right now, we have two thirds of our firefighters who are out sick because they've been exposed to COVID in the course of their normal job. That's because of the lack of mask wearing and the lack of following public health precautions of the larger community. So when people say, oh, you're infringing on my freedom by wearing a mask, they're forgetting that freedom is about the larger country. It's about the group all around them. And if you put a mask on, sure, you might protect yourself, but most of all, you're protecting our right to go out and do the things that make our country great. Like, of course, celebrating Thanksgiving. And we are here today because we didn't do the right things back in September and October. I would love nothing more than to be able to sit down with my extended family today, but I'm not doing it because that's the right thing. And that's what we stand for as a country is doing the right thing for each other, making those tough choices. Yeah. I, I hope that people will do the right thing to keep themselves safe. To, to that point, there are millions of healthcare workers today who are away from their families, who are working this Thanksgiving. I know hundreds of staff at the University of Wisconsin just wrote this open letter to the people of their state, and I just want to read part of it uh, to everyone watching right now. Uh, Wisconsin is in a bad place right now with no sign of things getting better without action. We are quite simply out of time. Without immediate change, our hospitals will be too full to treat all of those with the virus and those with other illnesses or injuries. Um, Dr. Rani, you know, post Thanksgiving gatherings, do you expect hospitals to be even more, and we've had so many stories about, you know, lack of beds already, but even more over capacity than that initial surge? I do, Brooke. You know, if only 1% of the 50 million people who've traveled this week end up catching or transmitting COVID, that's another 500,000 infections today alone. Our hospitals are already at the breaking point. Many of us are already talking about opening field hospitals next week. Many of us have colleagues who are out sick. Mayo Clinic has 900 workers who are out sick with COVID. My own hospital, we're on third backup for ER docs today because so many of us are out sick. Um, and I know, right? And so you, you combine that with this transmission today, and this is gonna be, I, I don't mean to be scary, but this is a potentially, um, today can change the course of COVID for our country for the rest of the year because infections that are sustained today are gonna to show up in three weeks and are gonna show up in deaths over Christmas and New Year's and are gonna spread in every state. So I, I just, my, I'm so thankful to my colleagues at University of Wisconsin for writing that letter and I just mm -hmm. wanna emphasize that's not just them, that's how healthcare workers literally across the country are feeling and hoping and praying today um, that their communities will listen. To that point, I just want to reiterate, you said that today really could be the make or break day with the future of COVID for the rest of the year and then going into 2021. For the people who have, you know, gone and, and seen the family, and again, it's like, it's so complicated. You, we, part of you wants to understand, but part of you thinks, why are you doing that for the safety of everyone else? What can people do tomorrow over the weekend to mitigate potential spread? Yeah, so I want to start by saying that this is a failure of messaging. Americans are confused and they're divided. And just like with the gun violence issue, it's because people have made this political instead of making it about health. So for those who have made the unsafe choice to get together with families today outside of their own nuclear household, the best thing to do is to just maintain contact with those people you are with today. Don't then go out to a bar. Don't then go out to an indoor restaurant. Stay just with the people you were with today. And on your return home, I implore on them to quarantine themselves. 
to stay home for 10 to 14 days and to get a negative test at the end of that. Having a negative test on Monday does not mean you did not get sick today. It takes somewhere around a week to 10 days for that test to turn positive. So if you made the choice to go and be with family today, do the right thing tomorrow and Monday and next Friday, stay home, don't expose other people. Wise words that we all need to hear. Dr. Megan Ranney, thank you so much. Thank you for everything you do and happy Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Pope Francis has written an opinion piece in the New York Times today, uh, pushing for compassion for those who have suffered due to coronavirus and frankly, calling out some people's selfishness. Let me read part of what uh, he has written. Quote, look at us now. We put on face masks to protect ourselves and others from a virus we can't see. But what about all those other unseen viruses we need to protect ourselves from? How will we deal with the hidden pandemics of this world, the pandemics of hunger and violence and climate change? If we are to come out of the crisis less selfish than when we went in, we have to let ourselves be touched by others' pain. Pope Francis there in an op-ed in the Times today. Coming up here on CNN, President-elect Joe Biden delivering a Thanksgiving message in a new op-ed here at CNN.com, expressing gratitude for frontline workers and the shared sacrifice of all Americans during such a tough time. Also ahead, President Trump pardons Michael Flynn after he admitted to lying to the FBI. The question we're asking today is, are more pardons on the way? And in a late night ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court sides with religious groups who were fighting restrictions intended to slow the spread of COVID. You're watching CNN on this Thanksgiving Thursday. I'm Brooke Baldwin. We'll be right back. It started with a blank wall. Play with quite the same efficiency. Here's the delay give to carry on Johnson. With them in person and not just over the airwaves this year. The stores and the meat packing plants to make sure that, that we contain this virus. Because we need to keep our economy open. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, that needs to be done. But we can and we must do it safely for everybody that's involved. And one other thing, sir, with all of your, that your members have gone through, grocery workers, um, and all they've had to deal with, they've been put in the position also of being enforcers, right? Like you said, you mentioned the fatigue. A lot of people are going to the stores. They don't want to put their masks on, but they, there are requirements that they have them on. So grocery workers are now in a position to try to enforce these rules. We've seen videos uh, that have gone viral, been out there over the past several months of, of fights or, or arguments that have broken out. Should your members not be put in that position? They try to do the best they can, but is that a position they should not be put in in trying to enforce these mask rules? I couldn't agree with you more, TJ. I mean, the fact of the matter is that they, they don't necessarily have the de-escalation skill sets that they need in order to be able to de-escalate a situation like that. Look, ultimately, we need uniform uh, mandates across the board so that one particular location doesn't operate differently than another so it becomes more uniform for the customers to understand that that's what they need to do and that these workers are not their enemies they're trying to protect them the customer as well as themselves and I don't think that's too much to ask for especially moving into this holiday season where we're always talking about how we need to take care of each other Thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you to your members. You have CW President Mark Barone, and thank you for being here with us on this day. TJ, thank you, and Amy, thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Happy holidays to you as well and your workers. Up next, right here, when we come back, the Minneapolis pastor with a twist on gratitude. It's very helpful on this Thanksgiving day. Yes, and she's helping many hang on to healing and hope in this very divisive time. And for six months now since the death of George Floyd, a killing at the hand of police that sparked nationwide protests. Stay with us on GMA3. My husband. Jay, you are going to be... Now, for reasons as simple as not being able to pay the property taxes on their homes, along with the complexities of not often having proper uh, estate planning in, in place, Grandmama and granddaddy own the home. They leave it to the uncle or the aunt, and nobody is, is caring for the taxes, et cetera. So this is a challenge that we see that's very common in the African-American community. The displacement 
zone that we created when I was on city council um, was in partnership with many of our philanthropic and our corporate partners in the shadows of the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, west side of Atlanta, historically African-American community. Um, we put in place a funding mechanism so for 20 years, homeowners could tap into this funding to pay, help pay their rising property taxes. So early in my tenure as mayor, we had an opportunity to um, engage in a development deal with CIM to develop a property called the Gulch, which again is near the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. This is gonna be the largest redevelopment, commercial redevelopment in the Southeast over the last 30 years. It's gonna create about 30 new city blocks in our city. So again, starting to think about what could we deliver for our communities as this economic benefit comes to our city. We created an affordable housing trust fund um, in, the, in addition to developing that economic development deal, knowing that surely there will be challenges on the west side of Atlanta with affordable housing, but as the city begins to grow in different corners, the entire city is impacted. So we wanted some flexibility with an anti-displacement zone, the same way we had created it on the west side, but to be able to use it throughout the city. We created this affordable housing trust fund. There's gonna be about $5 million that's going to go into that trust fund to allow us to create these displacement free zones throughout the city. But again, this is to the greatest shows on TV. Now open in Sioux Falls. We found him. And MJ, both just listening to the president-elect's Thanksgiving speech yesterday and reading the CNN op-ed, you know, really making this appeal to unity in this country. That's right. And they're clearly emphasizing that they understand this is going to be such a challenging and unusual uh, Thanksgiving period for so many families uh, across the country. You know, people who simply can't travel, they can't gather with the family members that they usually would uh, over this holiday because of this pandemic. Uh, and this is the same for the president-elect and his wife this year. Uh, they usually have the tradition of traveling so that they can uh, get together with their extended family. This is a holiday that they really enjoy and love and a time for them to be with their loved ones. And they're not uh, doing that this week. Uh, they are staying behind uh, here in Delaware this week and just getting together with a few members of their family uh, and demonstrating that, you know, even for them, the rules really do uh, apply. And as you said, we heard Joe Biden talking about this yesterday in his uh, national address. Uh, and then we have this new op-ed that is on CNN.com, and I just wanted to read uh, a piece of that. Uh, they write, like millions of Americans, we are temporarily letting go of the traditions we can't do safely. It is not a small sacrifice. These moments with our loved ones, time that's lost, can't be returned. Yet we know it's the price of protecting each other and one we don't pay alone. Isolated in our own dining rooms and kitchens, scattered from coast to coast, we are healing together. Now, I think there are just two uh, overarching things uh, that both Joe and Jill Biden are trying to do here. Uh, they're trying to empathize with sort of the pain that a lot of families are feeling across the country, talking about that missing chair at the dining room table, uh, and then just really urging Americans to please be responsible, that they are trying to do the responsible thing, and that they really urge others to do the same because a vaccine uh, is on the way soon, and they really hope that they can uh, see the country sort of turn the corner uh, sometime soon. We know the Bidens are normally in uh, Nantucket for Thanksgiving and like so many uh, of the rest of us, we're not where we normally are um, because we just want everyone to be safe and have a Thanksgiving next year. MJ in Delaware. MJ, thank you so much. Uh, the president-elect's priority is COVID. The president's focus, meantime, in his final days in office, and, and yes, they are his final days in office, is very, very different. Amplifying baseless voter fraud claims and trying to own the libs by any means necessary. His latest maneuver just so happens to chip away at the justice system, the president has pardoned Michael Flynn. Flynn 
Our thankful hearts should motivate us to do all that we can to alleviate or at least mitigate the suffering of other people. So as we give thanks and as, as we celebrate in whatever way we can in this crazy, chaotic time, we can do it in tension. And so this holiday season, as we celebrate Thanksgiving, this is one thing I would like to encourage people. We often say, uh, I'm thankful for what I have because there are other people who uh, uh, are worse off than I am. You know, I think it's time for us to release that mentality because our gratitude should not be contingent upon someone else's suffering. As we move into 2021, I think it's imperative that we do not let 2020 and all of its worries and insecurities drag us down. We all need to offer grace for each other. We need to be gracious to ourselves. We've done the best that we could in these unprecedented times, and we are going to move forward into 2021 in hope. And Reverend Angela certainly leads us in that direction, it's right? Every time. 2021 yet. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you know what? I am grateful for her. She has really She's helped so many of us actually over these past eight months. <laughs> so more please. Up next, when we come back, Dr. Jen Ashton with her Thanksgiving Day Q&A plus uh, a gratitude story with a capital G. Yes, the paramedic coming to the rescue in a unique way. The toddler now recovering and the big surprise ahead. Folks, you just gonna have to trust me on this one. Don't miss it. Stay with us. More Americans choose babies. Too much, too costly to exp uh, to uh, to defend the case. So there's a lot of reasons, and I think the review process was appropriate in this case, and dismissal I think was appropriate. Well, as far as the pardon goes, uh, Nancy Pelosi didn't like it very much. Here's a quote from her. She called it an act of grave corruption and a brazen abuse of power. And I want you to listen to what Adam Schiff said on another network earlier. The president pardons him and wants to portray him as some kind of a hero. Well, heroes don't lie to the FBI about contacts they have with hostile foreign powers. Uh, it is a, a body blow to our national security. It's also a body blow to the rule of law, uh, and I think makes a mockery of our democracy. A body blow to the rule of law, guy. What do you say to that? Uh, Rick, I, I think he's a little over the top. Look, so this is a guy who, for uh, years, um, trumped, no pun intended, but trumped a, some kind of Russian conspiracy that turned out to be completely void of evidence. And uh, clearly, with Speaker Pelosi, it's a partisan issue. Listen, if they don't like this uh, pardon, they better uh, strap, strap themselves in, because uh, I think you guys are right. In the next 30 days, you're yeah. going to see a bunch of these come out of the White House, just like, yeah. just frankly, just like past presidents, uh, uh, Obama included. I'm really interested to see who's next, uh, but we have another topic for you, Guy, and that is this uh, SCOTUS overturning the Cuomo restrictions in New York on houses of worship. Obviously a win for the Catholic diocese and synagogues in New York and New York City, but what about the rest of the country? So guys, anybody who thinks that these Supreme Court nominations don't matter a lot, uh, they need to check the box on this one because uh, Justice Amy uh, uh, Comey Barrett absolutely made a difference and your point is well taken listen it was unusual last night that they entered this order what right at midnight i believe and then that was on the heels of yesterday you've got two other states new jersey that's uh, issued a bunch of restrictions and california both of those uh, jurisdictions churches and synagogues and others have filed motions now emergency motions with the supreme court to or that, that swab up the nose will probably just get more samples back too. Thank you, Villem. That's NBC's Villem Marks reporting for us from London. Inauguration Day is 55 days away, and the transition to President-elect Joe Biden's administration is now, finally, officially underway. What will it take for President Trump and many other Republicans to accept the results and move on? I just kept saying, please be 
as the Lions are now. Wellness, well done. Personality and spirit. Size of some sort on Thanksgiving or any big holiday. Should they do it before or after eating? What's your preference? I would do it before because I like to run to fun. Ooh, that, like that's it. my slogan. What about Who you? wants to run after all that eating? <laughs> Well, it depends what time you eat your big Thanksgiving With the big meal. Turkey, all the Some of people. Wine, I'm going to go run. Oh, the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Running under the influence is not recommended. Okay. But now she tells in me. The, <laughs> <laughs> darn it! But in the world of sports nutrition and sports physiology, this is an area of significant controversy because some people will say, you know, should you fuel your workout? Or other people will say, do you need to replete after your workout? So before or after, it comes down to a couple of things. Number one, timing. Obviously, you don't want to finish a big holiday <laughs> meal and then go right up, put your sneakers on and go out for a big, you know, strenuous exercise, number one. So it comes down to timing, how soon before or after your meal, what you've eaten and how long you're planning to exercise. This one, you know, runs 10, 12 miles. Um, you're talking about, you know, you want to balance that in terms of timing very carefully. A lot of it just comes down to athlete preference. Right. You know, they know how they feel. Professional athletes eat their pregame meal four hours before right. their game. So bottom line is today, if you've already eaten, just go out for a walk. Yeah. Right, that's a, that's a good plan. And and honestly, people don't think, but you can run fasted. I get up first thing, and it's amazing how much fuel I have. Right. You think you need to, actually, if you're just doing like two, that's three That's the miles, job of your liver to yeah. convert and your muscles to store yeah. energy. And then you have the rest of the day to enjoy. <laughs> to eat. We'll be right back. <laughs> With Dakota News Now, we the sizes you can find. And here's a perky little one right now. The party animal. <laughs> One toothpaste brand in America, Crest. She grew up the idea of what a Even today, right? He's quite great. Just the one interception on a guy who makes a phenomenal play. Region Baseball has announced their Region 6 tournaments will be in Sioux Falls in 2021. I'm Elaine Lansing with your Seymour Direct mid -co Understanding how to talk to your doctor about treatment options is to avoid disaster and we're seeing the same thing of course with COVID and we have these numbers like workforce uh, by giving them the opportunity to come intern with us train with us re-employment I think is going to be the single biggest thing for us in the coming 12 to 24 months and we should all own that response standoff coat point of views like there it is there's the law Bassie wanted it and he got it. He had it. And so I saw the benefits when I went to the University of Nebraska. The way where and when you want it. Dakota News Now. It's news when you want it. Does it all. This is fun. Well, for you, maybe it is. Ma's probably found you missing and went out to get the marshal. Why don't we go, too? We'll do no such a thing. You're going to stay right where you're at. Let's play a game. Ain't that how we started? Playing games? You a traipsing around all over the prairie and me a running my head off. Imposed earlier this year by New York Governor Andrew Cuomo that the groups uh, said were unfairly aimed at religious institutions. And so this ruling gave us an idea of what to expect from this new justice, Amy Coney Barrett, who sided with conservatives in the 5-4 to four ruling. Chief Justice John Roberts sided with the more liberal justices. So to our uh, CNN Justice correspondent Jessica Schneider and Jeff Schneider, happy Thanksgiving first and foremost to you. Thank um, you. We know that this was the first, uh, the, the third case of its kind to get to the Supreme Court. The other two actually went the other way. What do you take away from this ruling? Well, it's the difference in the court's makeup ever since Justice Ginsburg's death and Amy Coney Barrett replacing her. So really, Brooke, this ruling is our first glimpse at how consequential the president's pick of Amy Coney Barrett will be for the future of the court. Here, she was critical in giving the conservatives the 5-4 majority since it was Chief Justice John Roberts who once again sided with the liberals as he had this past summer when Justice Ginsburg was still on the court. And when they actually cited 5-4 
against the houses of worship who are fighting these restrictions. So that's the flip side of what we're seeing here now with this next this new court makeup. So this late night decision on the eve of Thanksgiving, a very stark reminder of the split we will see on consequential cases moving forward. And as such, we saw some unusually critical language. We saw this from Justice Sonia Sotomayor. She said, Justices of this court play a deadly game in second-guessing the expert judgment of health officials about the environments in which a contagious virus now infecting a million Americans each week spreads most easily. But yet, on the flip side, the unsigned opinion from the majority conservative justices, it really seemed to punch back. This is what the unsigned opinion said. It said, members of this court are not public health experts, and we should respect the judgment of those with special expertise and responsibility in this area. But even in a pandemic, the Constitution cannot be put away and forgotten. So the conservative justice majority really seizing on the religious liberties that the Constitution affords in this case. Mm -hmm. And Brooke, like I mentioned for the first time, Justice Amy Coney Barrett being the key vote here to side with those churches who challenge these restrictions. It could be just a glimpse of what's to come as we move forward in the Supreme Court's term, Brooke. That is why I let I love it. Okay. okay, macaroni and cheese, but it has to be my Aunt Linda's. There's a specific <laughs> macaroni and cheese that my Aunt Linda K would make. Really? And that's the one I have to have. That's the one. Okay. So those are our Yum. side dishes. Folks. There you go. Right. So that was a side of tryptophan. <laughs> We're good to go. Um, and just one or two drinks. Just one or two. Okay, Doc. Okay. That's not what she says. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay, you can submit your questions as always at Dr. Jen on our Instagram at Dr. J. Ashton. All right, well, Thanksgiving is definitely a time to reflect, to show gratitude. And though that may seem hard to do this year for a lot of people, one family from Charlotte, North Carolina, is counting all of their blessings today. It has been nine months since their three-year-old son received a life-changing liver donation from a complete stranger. Take a look. Ian Charles was an average, playful, and energetic two-year-old when his parents, Dia and Paul, discovered a worrisome lump on his stomach. The lump turned out to be a tumor on his liver, and a few weeks later, Ian was diagnosed with hepatoblastoma, a rare form of liver cancer. With no time to process the news, Dia and Paul prepared their son to begin chemotherapy immediately. But after six sessions, doctors knew if Ian was going to survive, he would need a liver transplant. The news was crushing for Dia, who knew that meant spending months her son didn't have on a donor's list. But little did she know, just a few states over, a 28-year-old man was signing up to donate his liver and would turn out to be Ian's perfect match. In just two months' time, Ian successfully received a new liver and a new lease on life. Due to HIPAA regulations, Dia and Paul have never met Ian's donor and know almost nothing about him, but they've always wanted the chance to personally thank the stranger who saved their baby boy's life. Wow, joining us now is this beautiful family, <laughs> Dia, Paul, and now three-year-old Ian. We're so, yeah, yeah. so happy to have you with us today. And so the first thing we need to ask Dia, it's been nine months off. We see Ian there. How is he doing? Oh, man, he's awesome. <laughs> um, it's almost as if nothing nothing happened. You know, he's a uh, healthy, playful, same, same kid. Like, you, you wouldn't think that, you know, something like he going he's going through something like like <laughs> liver transplant you know you all have to take us back though and it's not the best place you want to go back to but give us an understanding right when kids are born people still go back to the 10 fingers 10 toes right you immediately want to know that your kid is okay right. but you find out right. two years old paul that your kid needs a new liver take us back to what that moment was like to find out that news Back to that moment, at first, it was, I was just sitting here playing with them, and I felt the mom. And I, you know, asked the question to his mom and my grandpa, I mean, his grandpa, you know, and they say, hey, you know, what do we do about this? And so, take him to the doctor in the morning. So, yeah, yeah took him to the doctor in the morning, uh, and, and the news came back. Yeah, so, like I said, there's a ton of things. <laughs> Wow. wow. And Dia, I mean, I, I cannot even imagine as a mom what that moment was like. How did you make it through those frightening months where you didn't know what was going to happen? Our, we have a very, very strong support system. Very, very, very strong support system. You know, um, as a parent, you wouldn't want, you know, 
to go through something like this. I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But um, getting through it, seeing him, you know, he's resilient. Children are very resilient. So, you know, seeing him happy, playing, he took everything, like in the pictures, like he had a smile on his face, kept a smile on his face. So he was the strength. And plus my support system, of course, is what getting us through this tough, that, that tough time. Oh, yes, having people around who are there for you in those moments makes all the difference in the world. I always say it's so important to accept that help, and you guys did. And we are very excited because we know that you're going to stick around, Dia, Ian, and Paul. You're all going to be with us because we have an incredibly important development on all of this that we want to ask you about. See, we're going to pique your interest there and want to pique the interest of our viewers as well. Yes, our special GMA3 Thanksgiving edition is back in just a moment, folks. Stay with us. Oh, wow. <laughs> We do it every night. Every night. I live alone, but I still do it every night. Right after dinner. Definitely after meatloaf. Like clockwork. Do it. Run your dishwasher with Cascade Platinum and save water. Did you know an Energy Star certified dishwasher uses less than four gallons per cycle while a running sink uses that every two minutes? That means even small loads can save water. So why not do it? Run your dishwasher every night with Cascade Platinum, the surprising way to save water. Welcome to the Quaker Breakfast Table, where new normals are created and where you watch them grow up. Here, simple whole grains are easy to enjoy. So grab life by the spoon or cup and nourish it. Quaker Oats. Shop Macy's Black Friday specials now, like great gift ideas the importance of family. There will be other jobs. You're the only dad I have. About faith. Not only am I going to compete, I'm going to win. And finding love in unexpected places with some of your favorite Fox faces joining along the way. This is the best Christmas I could have ever dreamed of. Christmas in the Rockies, a brand new original movie streaming now on Fox Nation. Save 35% when you use code 35 off. Since pioneering the SUV in 1935, the Chevy Suburban has carried many things. Nothing more important than family. Introducing the most versatile and advanced Chevy Suburban and Tahoe ever. Belsis isn't for people with type 1 diabetes or diabetic ketosis. When I was in high school, this was a theater. Family, rock solid might be your faith, and guess what else is rock solid? This right here. In spending more time with them, we've discovered the magnificence of this relationship that our dogs and cats don't just make us feel good. Find your rhythm, your happy place. Find your breaking point. Then break it. Every emergency gives you a potent blend of nutrients, so you can emerge your best with emergency. Get everything on your list worry-free with contactless shopping at Target. From same-day delivery to free drive-up. Quick and easy contactless shopping. All season at Target. To all the moms who make things cleaner, simpler, better. Arm & Hammer Clean & Simple has just six essential ingredients versus over 25 in the leading detergent and still has the same powerful Arm & Hammer Clean. More power to you. Brushing only reaches 25% of your mouth. Listerine cleans virtually 100%, helping to prevent gum disease and bad breath. Never settle for 25%. Always go for 100. Bring out the bowl. On the outside, I looked fine. I got really good at masking my depression, but inside was a different story. Even though I'd been on an antidepressant for months, I was still feeling depressed. Is there anything more I can do? Yes, adding Rixalti may help. When taken with an antidepressant, Rixalti was proven to reduce depression symptoms an extra 62%. This uncertainty to have that steadiness of, you know, someone who relies and cares for you so unconditionally is just so special. Mark, you are a doctor. Any suicidal thoughts and worse than What about the logs we were walking on before? One of those might work. 
muscle movements which may be permanent. Increased cholesterol, weight gain, high blood sugar, decreased white blood cells, unusual urges, dizziness on standing, seizures, trouble swallowing may occur. When depression sets you back, keep moving forward. Talk to your doctor about adding Rexulti to your antidepressant. Ashley Home Store's Black Friday sale ends Monday. Get up to 50% off, plus get an additional 10% off, or get 0% interest for six years. During the final days of the Black Friday sale, Ashley Home Store, this is home. You can always. I'm freaked out. Yeah. Let's move, let's just keep moving. Colder. Even the most experienced get killed out here. Life Below Zero. New episodes Tuesdays at 8 on National Geographic. 25 days, 25 days, 25 days of Christmas song. Frosty Grinch, Bob and Woody, and the Santa Claus. So much crazy Christmas since the Yuletide Marathon. What's it called? I forgot. Three forms, 25 days of Christmas song. Did you hear that? It sounds like... The most merry musical event of the year. First, your favorite holiday songs performed by the biggest stars with a touch of Disney magic. The Disney Holiday Sing-Along. Welcome to our CMA Country Christmas home. Then, join host Thomas Rhett, Lauren Akins, and your favorite stars for country's most festive night. CMA Country Christmas. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Monday on ABC. Back here on GMA3 with this amazing family. The three-year-old son successfully receiving a liver transplant last year with the help of a complete stranger filling a piece of his liver. Little Ian Charles overcoming a rare form of cancer. We're here with Ian and his mom and dad. Good to see you all again. Welcome back. And again, we're glad you all are sharing your story. This is a day that a lot of folks are being certainly thankful. You all have plenty to be thankful for, but you don't know who to thank. Um, what do you, and you may never, I guess, know who to think. That's just how some of the rules go. But what would you say? How do you feel about that stranger who, who stepped forward and essentially saved a life? I'm just grateful. Like, it's nothing that I can actually say or do. But I'm, I'm, just, I'm just grateful. That was very selfless of him and anybody else who, who uh, decided to donate. With the help of New York Presbyterian, we found Ian's donor. His name is wow. Will Lindbergh, <laughs> and we want you all to hear his story. So take a look. Oh. By the age of 12, Will Lindbergh from Cambridge, Massachusetts, knew that he wanted to save lives. It was after being inspired by the EMTs who came to his dad's rescue after suffering from cardiac arrest. Sadly, Will lost his dad to pancreatic cancer two years later. Will became a full-time paramedic in 2018 and one day came across a patient who was experiencing the same decline from liver failure he'd seen in his father years before. It was at that moment Will decided to become an organ donor. A few months after his donor assessment exams, a recipient was selected. Will didn't know much about his recipient, except that he was a little boy in a life or death situation. Without any hesitation, Will went through the operation on February 4th, 2019, and after experiencing a few complications himself, Will returned to work in the most crucial months of the COVID-19 pandemic. Not only did his donation save the life of two-year-old Ian Charles, but as an essential worker, Will is committed to protecting countless American lives during the pandemic. Ah. Oh. I mean, I have tears in my eyes watching that. Dia, what do you think, now knowing where Ian's liver came from? It makes sense. <clears throat> it makes sense. I'm still forever grateful to them for going through to do something like that. We, did, we had no idea. We were told he was going to, you know, needed a transplant. And when you think transplant, you think of lists. So you're going to be on a list for months at a time, years at a time. But it literally took maybe, what, two months? Two months it was, and it, it makes sense. I'm oh my god, I, I really, really, really want to meet. I want to meet him. Well, we were watching, uh, I couldn't help it. I was staring at you all's faces as you all were hearing the name and the story the time, yeah. of the person uh, yeah. who donated. You still want to meet him, so why don't you say hi then, guys? Say hi to Will Lindbergh hi. right now, <laughs> who is here. <laughs> say hi to Will. Will, say hi. Hi there, guys. <laughs> You're very, very, very welcome. Oh my God, this is okay. <laughs> I wasn't expecting this at all. Yeah, you, you, you saved. Oh my God, you saved my, you saved my son's life, and I is ne I can never repay you for that. I really can't. But 
Like Paul said, you are welcome to the family cook <laughs> You're part of the family now. You're part of the family now. Oh, my God. Will. Will, Will, Will. Now I have a name. Will. <laughs> Will, oh Will, we have a name and a face here, Will. And we saw a part of your story there, but you have them in front of you now. You wanted to meet them as well. Um, why, why did you, you had no idea how this was going to work out, and, but why did you want to do it, and what do you think now, seeing that little boy right there in front of you? Uh, he's adorable, and it's so nice to see you for the first time. Uh, I was just tearing up watching the promo a few minutes ago, but... Hey, hey buddy, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Shout. Yeah. He, he shout what he wants to be. <laughs> And, and, you know, Will, I think a, a lot of people, you know, don't realize that they can save lives, too. And you're sitting there seeing a life that you saved and, and the gratitude on this Thanksgiving Day. I wonder if you have a message for anyone watching about how we all can do good. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing with liver donation is I was initially interested in doing it because of a patient I ran into. Um, but what really made me sort of follow through after that initial interest was learning about how the liver regenerated. Um, you know, there are many, many people in need of kidneys, and there are many wonderful kidneys. But the thing that really got stuck in my head was the fact that I had the ability to give this really important gift. Uh, and then, as we're speaking, it's, it's already grown back. Um, so you can make this donation without really losing anything yourself. Well, uh, well, guys, I, I don't necessarily need you all to say a hi and a bye because I am pretty sure you all are going to be at the same cookout here pretty soon. Um, I, and I'm sure we'll make sure that you all are in touch as much as you want to. But I can't thank you all enough. This is that day. Thank you so much for being here. And congratulations on what you do, the message you're sending, and good to see a healthy Ian there. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you again. Thank you again, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, what a perfect, perfect story on this day. And we needed that yes. this year, didn't we? On this day. They just went, ah, oh, okay, we're good. There's good. There's a lot of good happening. We just need to highlight it.